Uh, so we're hoping to restart the meeting. We've had an issue with the sound on the uh, web streaming. Hopefully it's working now. I'm assuming, unless someone comes and stops me again, it is. Um, so an updated action log was included with the published papers for this meeting and an additional update was circulated this morning to committee members by the email by the Director of Education. Do we have any questions on the action log? Uh, Councillor Hoy, please. Uh, just a quick one regarding the Wisby secondary. Um, obviously, there's a point about the RSC, but also on the action log, we have asked for um, progress reports. And I believe after speaking with officers at a different event yesterday, there is, a, there is an update. So I understand that perhaps you can't share it right now, um, but if we could have an update for the next committee, that'd be really useful, please. Yeah, very, very happy to provide that. So. Thank you. Anyone, anyone, anything else on the action log? No. Uh, in which case we will take that as noted. Thank you, Rishenda. Item four. Item four is petitions and public questions. We have one request to speak, which has been received and will be heard under the next item. No petitions have been received at this time. As I mentioned at the start of the meeting, I'm exercising my discretion as chair to vary the order of business from the published agenda in order to take item 14, the response to the local government Om ombudsman report as the first substantive item of business. I further exercise my discretion to accept a late request to speak by the family which the report concerns. Jonathan Lewis, Director for Education, will introduce this report and we will then hear the family's comments. Thank you, John. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me? Okay, this is a bit echoey. Great. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm going to start by offering uh, my sin sincere apologies to the family impacted by the LGO report. Uh, the LGO's role and function is to oversee the uh, statutory duties of the local authority, uh, and in this case, the offer we've made to the family in relation to uh, SEND and supporting a child's needs. Uh, our aspiration as a local authority is to meet the needs of all children and young people uh, and ensure that we maintain good relationships throughout meeting our statutory obligations uh, and fulfilling our duties in terms of educational outcomes for uh, our children and young people. Uh, in this scenario, we have not met that aspiration, uh, for which I'm hugely apologetic. Uh, we fully accept the findings of the Local Government Ombudsman report, uh, and we're working hard to address these in relation to the specific case but also to influence uh, our practices and approaches moving forward. Obviously, within the report, we have given you details of, of the findings of the LGO. There is a link to the full report, which you, you may wish to uh, look in at more detail. Uh, and what we've sought to do in section two of the report is provide an update on the specific actions uh, the LGO has asked the local authority to, uh, to undertake. Um, the case outlined is very specific. Uh, it would not be possible for me to go into high levels of details, uh, given it is a confidential report and we wish to respect that confidentiality uh, for the family uh, that are involved. Uh, I will again, however, acknowledge that we've not met the requirements of the SEND Code of Practice and other legislation and ensuring appropriate provision was in place for this child uh, in terms of meeting their needs. Uh, I also acknowledge there is a loss of education for the child uh, and acknowledge the stress and anxiety this has caused the family. Um, what I've sought to do in section three is address the concerns and how we move forward as a local authority to ensure we didn't have a reoccurrence of uh, these particular challenges. Uh, the, the first thing I did on receipt of the LGO report was brought together the relevant officers uh, to consider the chronology, the decision-making, uh, the outcomes that were reached, uh, and uh, we fully reconsidered how we may address these differently going forward. So what you'll see in section three of the report is a, is a detailed uh, oversight of uh, a range of training, uh, different approaches, processes, uh, use of systems uh, that we believe will be put in place. Uh, and we, we start to put those in place now and we will across the autumn uh, to ensure there is no reoccurrence. Uh, we take all complaints very seriously uh, and uh, we hope that these actions will address any concerns uh, going forward. Uh, and I'd like to reiterate lessons have been learned from this particular case. Um, but I think I'll stop there, Chair, and uh, obviously happy to answer questions later in, in this report. Thank you, Jonathan. I'd like to welcome Stephen Moore, the uh, Chief Executive of Cambridge County Council, and he would also like to uh, say a few words at this time. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to committee for the invitation to join you today. 
you will shortly be hearing a statement from the family concerned. I wanted to reaffirm my personal apologies as Chief Executive of the Authority in public. I have written and expressed my apologies directly to the family in person as well. We did not get this right for their child. I am sorry. Yes, we will seek to learn lessons, as the Director of Education has said. Yes, we are committed to improving our services for children and young people with special educational needs or disabilities, but we did not get this right. Chair, I'm both mindful of and respectful about the need to protect the identity of both the child and their family. We are continuing to engage with them, and I hope we'll be able to use their deeply regrettable experiences constructively to inform improvements to practice, to improvements to performance, and importantly, to improvements to our culture. But we did not get this right. Chair, I remember when the Every Child Matters Green Paper was first published by a previous government and the emphasis was rightly being placed upon putting children and their needs at the heart of decision making. This approach has been confirmed and supplemented by subsequent governments. The principle of placing children and young people at the heart of decision making has to remain central to what we do, but also how we behave as an authority and as professionals in the future. We will get this right, irrespective of the time that may take. Thank you. Thank you. In order to preserve the, pres the anonymity of the family, the parent concerned will only be referred to as Mrs X. I would also emphasise to all present, it's imperative we do not say anything during this public meeting which could reveal the identity of the family concerned. Mrs X's comments were circulated this morning to committee members for information and in accordance with her wishes, they will now be read by the Democratic Services Officer. Thank you, Rishenda. We are extremely grateful for the report by the local government and social care ombudsman. Not enough parents know that this free service exists. My son is an amazing nine-year-old boy who is severely disabled and has a host of medical and educational needs. Our case predates the pandemic, but once it was clear that he had vulnerable, had clinical vulnerabilities to COVID-19 and could not attend school, in order to get alternative provision, I wrote many letters to the council. Much of my time was spent replaying current legislation to council officers. Either they knew their statutory duties and chose to ignore them, or they were ignorant of the law. Which is it? The Ombudsman, Michael King, said about the report, and I quote, the council has demonstrated a fundamental lack of understanding of its legal obligations and duties towards children in the county. My family has been subjected to unprofessional and in some cases unlawful behaviour by the council. We feel we have been ignored and misled. This is not a few bumps in the road. This has been a prolonged and sustained process over a period of three years. The actions and inactions of the council have amounted, in my view, and I do not use these words lightly, to a form of persecution and bullying. Let me be clear, as a result of the Ombudsman's report, we have received a personal apology from Chief Executive Stephen Moyer, together with the financial remedy recommended by the Ombudsman, and for this we are grateful. But it is alarming that the Council has still not put things right. To date, my son is receiving some alternative provision, but it is not the full-time education and SEM provision to which he is entitled, and which the Ombudsman required the Council to act on. Twelve weeks have passed since the report was issued, and still this has not been put in place. The claim in the Director of Education's report on the Ombudsman's findings under 2.3 that the responses to two key recommendations are in progress and on track is not satisfactory. Please confirm as a result of this meeting the specific actions councillors intend to, to make to put my son's full and lawful provision in place. Looking more widely, I urge the council to consult with representatives from the LGSCO and organisations such as the IPSEA, parent forums and other third parties to consider what better early interventions could look like, to re-examine the way it can support children with special educational needs and disabilities, and to bring the outcomes of those discussions back to this committee later this year so that genuine transformation can commence. I have indicated to Mr Moyer and to Councillor Nessinger that I would welcome the opportunity to be personally involved in the service improvement programme. Today is a very public line in the sand and I ask you to take meaningful action and to clarify for me 
and for all other families in a similar position, how you're going to put this right and ensure it never happens again. Thank you, Rishenda. I'd like to thank the family for bringing their case to committee today. And as a fellow parent to a child with special educational needs, I understand the additional pressure this can bring, particularly with the pressure from the pandemic as well. Thank you also for your offer to be involved in the ongoing improvements of our SEND service. We will make sure we share the details of Pinpoint, our parent carer forum, as we already work with them on our current program and always welcome views and contributions from our families, children and young people. Thank you again for your statement today. I will now open the report to committee for comment and debate. Again, though, I'd like to remind all members and officers of the importance of respecting the anonymity of the family concerned. Councillor Ambrose Smith, please. Sorry, Councillor Prentice, please. Kent, apologies. Right, uh, sorry, Chairman, I was a bit confused there as to who you were asking to speak. Um, I'm not going to make any comment on the Ombudsman's decision or our response to it, but I was a bit, it's in the presentation of what is a public uh, uh, paper now, since it's cut in our agendas, is in um, paragraph 2.3, it ref in a couple of the bullet points, it refers to pay the family to recognise the lack of education rather than, say, financial compensation. So while it may seem a matter of semantics, it just does not read right to me, pay somebody to do something when you're actually and as they say um as the um this is x refers to um financial remedy so could we just be careful in how we prepare these sorts of papers but it just doesn't read right to me when you pay somebody rather than financially compensate them it may seem trivial chairman but it is a matter and it may be a matter of semantics but i just don't like the way it read um, I, I agree. Um, what we've reproduced here is the, the findings of the LGO report. So that is the narrative that was in the report. So uh, accept that. I think we can probably think about how we present that better if, if we have this occurrence again. Councillor Hoy, please. Yeah, just two questions. Um, a bit concerned about why we still aren't providing provision. Um, that's obviously been highlighted in the statement and also in the report. And just what insurances um, can we be given that there aren't other children um, in similar circumstances out there uh, that we aren't dealing with, please? Um, Chair, um, in, in terms of uh, the situation, we are still in dialogue with the parent, so we're, we're very aware of, of uh, the statement, uh, the action is still outstanding, and we are having correspondence in relation to resolving those issues. So I, I can't go into more details than that, but that is ongoing. Um, in, in terms of this scenario, this, this is a very specific case. Um, you know, we obviously are monitoring uh, children's needs across the board. Um, you know, we, we always strive to, to, to make sure need is met. Uh, I'm not aware of a specific case uh, that mirrors this, this scenario, um, but obviously my teams have heightened awareness, the training we've done, the issues that have been raised as action and remedies, I hope we'll address those issues uh, sooner, but I'm certainly not aware of a, an identical case to this that's currently ongoing. Councillor Lettersinger, please. Thank you. Um, so, so I think this is a very serious case um, and I think it's very good to see the council taking it seriously in its response. Um, and I'm grateful to Stephen for the work that he's done in meeting with the family um, and certainly in the conversations I've had with the family. Also, um, I hope I've made it very clear that um, we hope to do better uh, with our SEND provision in future. Um, I do want to say, though, that the um, the time of the pandemic was the most awful and difficult time um, for parents with children with SEND and for the council in trying to support them. Um, and, and I think it, it's worth just remembering just how, what a nightmare that time was for everybody concerned. Um, I think many parents with children with SEND um, suffered from extreme anxiety about the risk that the, the pandemic would 
bring to their children, absolutely understandably and rightly, because it, it was um, very uncertain and many um, disabled children are extremely vulnerable. Um, so, and, and, and I think that, that the isolation that that brought to families um, with children in, the, in those circumstances was horrendous. Um, and I think it's important that we recognize that that was the case, but also um, that the um, council staff who were trying to deal with that situation and trying to deal with um, kind of endlessly changing situations in terms of schooling and advice on children, it was also a horrendous time for them. Um, so well, clearly in this case, we got things wrong and we've recognized that we've got things wrong. I do think it's important that we also recognize just what a difficult time it was for everybody um, and that um, that everybody at the time was trying to do their best um, even if under some circumstances we didn't manage it as well as we should have done. I just thought it was worth saying that. Thank you. So if we move to the report's recommendations, co-opted members of the committee are eligible to vote on this item. The committee is being asked to A, note the report, B, ask for areas of clarity, and C, agree whether there is further reporting to the committee from the actions arising from the report. We have already rec completed recommendations A and B, and we now need to decide whether we want op to direct officers to provide any further reports in relation to actions arising from this report to committee. I think, um, sorry, Councillor Hoy. I don't know if necessarily we need a report, but it might be useful to have on the action log about this issue regarding um, them being given provision, because I would hate to, in a year's time, them still not be in appropriate provision. So I think it doesn't need to have, perhaps be too onerous, but in the action log, we should be updated as to how the provision is progressing. I'm very happy to do that. Obviously, what we have been bringing you recently is the update on provision and, and, and space. I think what would be helpful maybe is to expand that to include other types of provision where we're meeting need, just so you have some visibility on the pressures and assistance, things like tuition, alternative position placements. So uh, I will incorporate that in future reports. Thank you. So uh, assuming no further proposals, um, I think we shall take that as read unless anyone wishes to vote on this one. No, thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you, Stephen. Item five. Item five is the finance monitoring report outturn for 2022-23. No, 2021-22. Martin Wade joins us. He's the strategic finance business partner and uh, he will present this report. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so this is sets out the position at the end of the uh, last financial year. Um, so at the end of the financial year, the uh, budgets within the remit of this committee underspent um, by about one point, uh, just under one point seven million pounds, um, excluding the dedicated schools grant. So the uh, the covering report and the accompanying full finance monitoring report set out the detail behind that. Um, so I won't go into, to, into the detail particular areas. The only um, area I did want to draw attention to um, was around the dedicated schools grant in particular, um, which as um, members will be aware, um, is um, considerably overspent in previous years and um, ended the, the financial year with a net overspend of, of £12.43 million, pounds, um, which adding to the, the previous cumulative deficit resulted in a, a figure just short of, of £40 million pounds being carried forward into, into the current financial financial year. Um, as um, Direct Service Director of Education has previously reported, we are working um, with the DfE at the moment um, around a number of um, um, areas to, to recover that, that position um, and there will be further reports on that as we come, but I just thought that was a, a particular area um, to draw to your attention. Um, at the end of the last financial year. Um, the only other thing um, just to say there in, in the full report, it um, also um, pulls out some of the final, um, the final um, balances at the end of the year for both capital and for some of the um, earmarked reserves, which are pertinent to this committee as well for your information. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there and, and take any questions and any of the detail within the report. Thank you. Councillor King, please. Thank you, Martin. Um, I have a question. I think it's Nicola for, for yourself as Director of Children's Services. And uh, if 
it's right kind of uh, the first paragraph on page 17 uh, talking about our underspend, uh, the net underspend of 3 million around children's safeguarding. And we kind of all very aware that that translates into a lot of vacancies for social workers. So if you could just let us know what uh, is the latest on the recruitment campaign we've been running for a few months now and I know we know there is a workforce strategy or something to kind of encourage more social workers to to join us and to, to improve retention. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor King. And yes, um, you're absolutely right. The main underspend um, for children was, was entirely in relation to staffing. Some of it was in relation to staffing vacancies that we had held because we we're about to do um, the early help redesign that I know the committee's heard about before. So that does account for some portion um, of the underspend, which is now going ahead and will um, take place in the autumn. But the bulk of it is, is indeed due to due to not having staff in some of the frontline teams. The bulk of children's services, just to reassure the committee, is very well staffed. It is particular frontline teams that we are continuing to have difficulty in recruiting, as are most local authorities in the country, unfortunately, now. Um, we have made significant headway. We do now have a programme board chaired by um, our chief executive, um, who's with us this morning, um, and we are in the process of assembling um, the workforce team, so a dedicated team that will work with me, um, HR and, and comms colleagues, um, to try and progress things. Um, I'm really pleased that we um, I can't give you her name because it's provisional, but I'm very much hoping we have appointed project lead um, as of yesterday, um, and she will hopefully start on Monday. Um, so I'm happy to send that round as soon as I, I can confirm completely. But we do have, and she's very experienced, she's worked in five or six local authorities with similar challenges around um, promoting recruitment. So we're, I'm quite pleased, and I think that will, will make a real difference. Thank you. Councillor Sharp, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor King's asked one of the questions I was going to ask. I've got about four questions. Um, but if I can go on from that, um, obviously we've got the vacancies. Um, so I'm just looking, page, yeah, I'm looking at page 50. Um, Obviously, there's difficulty in terms of recruitment. What what percentage of the establishment of staff are the vacancies running at? And what with with that level, I'm presuming we're not um, recruiting or using agency staff. If we are, then I'm not sure where they've gone in terms of the numbers. And then, if we aren't, what what are we not able to do, or work we're not able to do to um, provide the service? If that makes sense. That makes complete sense, Councillor Sharp. Um, so we are in some teams, we are running at around a 40% vacancy rate. So that is some teams, and I and I really want to stress that. So in other teams, we have 90% or 100%. So we are talking about a very um, focused area of frontline teams where we have got um, staffing difficulties at that level. We are continuing to recruit agency. It is very difficult. So again, um, in the region, um, I was talking to the DCS colleagues um, in the last couple of days, we're all finding it difficult to recruit agency staff now. We do have um, a dedicated team in at the moment in our most hard pressed area where the staffing is the level I've just described. Um, and they're working very effectively. And actually they are, um, a little bit more expensive, and that's one of the other issues. Um, so we are using some of um, that money this year, um, but that team are in and they're working very effectively. There is no work that we're currently not able to undertake. So we have been very carefully monitoring that. Um, I do that directly with the assistant directors. I report back to Charlotte and to the chief executive and actually to um, chair of this committee on a weekly basis around um, staffing level levels, caseloads um, and activity. And I'm confident that we are seeing all of the children we need to see, we're allocating all the work we need to allocate and we are carrying out all of our functions currently. Okay, if I can come back, yeah, sorry. Um, so 
in, in turn, obviously we've got the underspending. We, are, are we are we able to have we rolled that some of that money forward into this year? So obviously we do overspend because we're recruiting um, agency staff at a, a bigger cost. I I understand we're all shopping or swimming in the same pool um, around the country for for the same staff, and I understand it's very difficult. But it's just trying to get an idea of what impact that's having on our services. Yeah, so the underspend from last year would, would have rolled forward into the overall general reserves for the council generally, so it, it doesn't come back into the into the specific budget. However, uh, given the predicted level of, of vacancies overall still within the service, there's still enough flexibility within the available budgets to fund those additional uh, costs associated with the higher cost agency staff and also to support the workforce development um, plan, which is ongoing at the moment. So we've costed that up and, and there is flexibility within there to, to to manage that um, if we were to to exceed that there is the opportunity to, to request additional funds to support that it's been recognized that it is obviously a priority area at the moment and and if that was the case and those those funds which are available were exceeded we, we would go back through the, the appropriate governance arrangements to request additional funding to support that okay thank you um, if I can just, um... On, on the same page, page 50, we've got the corporate grants, which I noticed we've received um, inc increased money from um, grant allowance from the Home Office. So we've ended up um, with, with an underspend there. Do, do we have to return that grant money to the Home Office or, or do, are we able to roll it forward? Or again, does it just go into the general reserves? So that in that particular case, that fund, we don't have to repay that. Um, it's calculated based on, on the formula um, from, the, from the Home Office and that, that goes into our over money. So part of it goes into the general fund. Part of it we do hold in a specific earmark reserve in case those costs do um, increase in, in the following year. So again, we've allowed for that within the within the available budgets thank you and one more question and one one comment um on page 68 all of the non-baseline budget grants do we presumably need to because they're not baselined within our budget we need to bid for those each year or they're obviously change um year to year basically it's good to pay yeah, yeah sorry yeah sorry. um yeah so um a number of these are our continuation grants in terms of um, um amounts so quite often in a lot of these instances we don't hear about what the final allocation is going to be until quite close to the start of the, the financial year however in most cases we, we do have that so most of the ones you can see listed there are continuations it's just what the amounts are going to be um, hence why we don't build it into the base budget at, at the start of the individual year just looking down i can't see anywhere we have to actually bid for as such um, some are going to be dependent on outcomes um, so for example um, the um, adult skills grant education and skills funding agency grant that will be based on the outcomes of the of the adult skills service and, and that grant can flex and the same with some of the other it will be dependent on activity and outcomes as to what the final amount is but they're not bids as such they're they're allocations based on um, based on um, different criteria one last it's just a comment really on or um I, I do find it difficult going around with the obviously within the report we've got adults and um and health um numbers in here as well and i'm an accountant so i'm i can get around it maybe a bit better than others but i'm sure there may be other colleagues who are who are not so familiar with numbers who are struggling a bit more i just just find it a bit muddled and I, I'm, it, it's obviously been presented that way in the past but it, that's purely a comment yeah, I completely recognise that. And it's a discussion we've been having um, previously. I mean, in terms of the covering report, we do try and obviously put some of the summary information in the covering report to, to try and make that easier for members to follow. But I do appreciate now, especially with, with adults, and as you say, public health as well, the report has become um, quite unwieldy, should we say, in, in terms of how it does. So um, we can potentially look at if there's any other things we can do to try and make it easier for, for members to follow through. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bula, please. 
Thank you, Chair. I think we've all seen uh, in the latest, the first published results of the census, how growth has accelerated even further in our county. And, you know, in Cambridge alone, I found it really interesting. We have about 17% more people now than we had in 2011, and actually the fifth largest increase in population from amongst the 331 districts. So my question is a more general question about central government grants, especially the dedicated schools grant, is do you have in any insights yet into how the Department of Education Education will take into account this recent data? Would they review anything if yes, when? Because it seems that the growth is really unprecedented, especially in Cambridge. So I'm just wondering if the department will actually adjust and match funding a bit better in our county. Thank you. Okay, so the dedicated schools grant is actually adjusted each year based on pupil numbers as at the October school census. So the main schools funding element of that is uplifted each year to take into consideration that that changes in pupil numbers and the changes in mixing deprivation, free school meals and extra. So actually that element of the of the dedicated schools grant is actually quite reactive to, to changes in, in overall pupil numbers. Um, as we've spoken around the high needs block element of that where there are specific pressures, I think it's fair to say that is less reactive in terms of the changes in, in overall numbers and, and overall levels of need and complexity of need um, and it's obviously something that that has been said is going to be looked at as part of the next stages of, of the, um, the the national changes to funding but when that potential will be implemented um, we're not quite sure at the moment so main schools funding yes is very reactive to that change in the census I think the high needs element probably less so it's fair to say. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so a couple of things. Um, thank you very much for the report. Um, one of the things I have uh, raised with officers in the past is some interesting use of the English language. Um, and I would like to ask for... Um, a, a more simple approach to the text. I, I refer to page 29 of our agenda in paragraph 1.4.2, the very last paragraph of that. Um, there's some mental gymnastics that have to go on here to understand what's being said. So we're talking about a final increased net underspend of about three million pounds, which is complicated enough in itself. And then we're told that the majority of this underspend was as a result of an overachievement of the vacancy savings target. Now, I understand why those words are being used, but um, we then go on to say a difficulty in recruiting to social worker posts and also posts becoming vacant with recruitment of vacancies taking longer. But basically what we're talking about is not being able to recruit and people leaving. And um, I'm just wondering if we could firstly express that more simply. Um, so was this retirements or was this resignations? And that brings me on to another question. So the question is, the first one is, please, can we express these things more simply? The second one is, do we understand why people are leaving and why we're having difficulty recruiting. So for example, are we doing exit interviews? I understand the County Council does automatic, in other words, online, neutral, via a machine exit interviews. And I'd like to know if we're actually working out what, why people are leaving. And uh, if that's simply that they're going to other jobs elsewhere or better jobs that are better, better you know, if they're going to promotions, that's lovely. Uh, but if they're going to better paid jobs or less stressful jobs, it would be really helpful to know. Um, and I'd like us to have some feedback on that. Um, thirdly, the, I just wanted to pick up on what Mr. Wade said about underspends getting rolled into the general reserve. And I just wanted to check that that money doesn't get lost to um, children's services. It, I'm hoping that that money still is available to us to use in future. Um, so perhaps you could clarify that. 
Thank you. So if I do, I'll just pick up the first and then the, the final point and then over to Nicola to talk about some of the elements. So yeah, uh, in, in terms of the wording, yeah, we can certainly look at simplifying the, the narrative in, in terms of how we how we present things in these in these reports. And um, I think it, it, what tends to happen, if I'm honest, is as the report kind of evolves during the year, different elements kind of get uh, kind of added onto it. So we'll make sure that we we, we write it in a in a in a clearer, simplified manner wherever possible. Um, in, in terms of the reserves, you know, the reserves it, it's how it works within the local. Authority authorities that reserves will all get rolled forward into into the general fund um, and in terms of the overall county council reserves each year however some elements of it will come back to children's services through three different routes depending on depending on what it actually um, actually is as I say there are a number of earmarked reserves for, spe for specific purposes which are targeted for, for children's services but the, the bulk of the the overall county council reserves form part of our reserves which we require to have um, as, as a local authority to support the ongoing um, the, on, the ongoing um, functions of the local authority more generally. So some elements will come back to children's services, but some elements will just go into, into the overall overall county council's pot. Thank you, Martin. Um, hi, Councillor Bradnam. Um, so first of all, you're right that we do have an online um, system for people um, saying um, why they're leaving. People don't always complete that, to be honest. Um, so it's not always um, very useful. And one of the things we've done, I spoke earlier about the workforce um, team that we're bringing together. One of the elements of that is actually a dedicated post that is going to look at exit interviews and meeting with people directly to try and get um, more information from them. Um, helpfully, however, we do have some, uh, some sense of that, partly because when we um, completed the recruitment campaign, the agency that came in did some focus groups, so talked to some people who were leaving and, and what was important to them. But we've also been part of a regional piece of work generally that literally reported last week. So I also have more regional data, but our staff did take part in all of that. So I think there's a combination of reasons. Um, so some people are um, have rethought, and I think this has happened quite a lot in the public sector, and perhaps not just in the public sector, but some people have rethought their lifestyles and what they want um, following COVID, and they have made some active choices. So we have had some earlier retirements, um, perhaps than we might have done, um, and some people just stepping out of social work altogether. Um, we have had some promotions, so we have had some people move um, between authorities and, and move on and also move up. Um, in, in role. So we've done that very successfully, actually, with some posts. We are seeing, unfortunately, a little bit of a trend of people going to agency now, because you can get paid an awful lot more money. And I think for people at the moment, you know, cost of living and things like that are actually quite important. I think the other thing we know is that obviously, um, the less people there are, the more pressures and demands there are upon um, staff. Um, the things that make people stay are um, good caseloads, reasonable caseloads, and really good frontline manager. So you stay for your manager and, and the kind of work that you're doing, basically. So we're working very hard on that. Caseloads have come down because of the agency teams that we've brought in, um, and we are working hard with managers. We have incredibly dedicated staff. You know that that are here already and are staying and we have a lot of people who do stay so people have very long careers in Cambridgeshire so we just need to build on that and develop that the problem at the minute you always have people who moved on you know social work is a profession where people do move on usually around after three years or so when they train um, the problem is we're not able to recruit in anymore and that's the same really as as most other local authorities so we need to think differently about our pipeline and how we grow our own and that's part of what the new team will do as well okay thank you thank you councillor nestinger please thank you um i've got a couple of points i wanted to um, raise, which are slightly different ones, a, a slightly higher level than some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, it, it strikes me that this particular outturn is, um, is kind of a, another year of pandemic, if that makes sense. And an awful lot of the decisions that were being made when we were, when, when you were putting this budget together, um, there was a, a huge amount of uncertainty about what the impact of the pandemic was going to be on 
um, on many of our budgets. Um, and the, one of those was um, that I think there was a, a certain amount of expectation that there would be a spike in looked after children numbers after the lockdowns. Um, now, my understanding is that that didn't really happen in the way that we were expecting. Um, and maybe Nicola, you can um, confirm or um, tell me otherwise if I'm wrong about that. But I think that there was a lot of concern that actually after people have been um, made to stay with their families for a very long time, there would be a whole bunch of issues. And, and interestingly, that was not quite as bad as people expected it to be. So therefore, there are some things in this budget um, possibly some of which may also be part of that understand which where, where we were anticipating high numbers and they haven't materialized but that there are other places in the budget where actually there have been huge pressures and, and special educational needs and disability is one of those and um, and that we've seen um, increases in the number of children who are needing additional support in school or are not able to cope in school or are suffering from anxiety and mental health problems and therefore for the coming year, there will be a certain amount of need to, to reflect on those differences and rebalance the budget accordingly. Um, so um, I, I, the thing I think I'm really wanting to know is, is am I right about the, the, SEN, the, the, um, the SEND numbers and the looked after children numbers? So if I just address the first bit of that and then, then I can um, ask John to talk to you in more detail. But, but yes, essentially, yes, you're absolutely right, Councillor Singer. Um, nationally, there has been some increase in children care numbers, actually, from um, the end of the pandemic. We haven't seen that in Cambridgeshire um, really at all. There is a slight uptick now. So um, when we look at the performance report later on, you'll see a slight increase happening now. That is mostly to do with unaccompanied asylum seeking children and then a few, a couple of large families. But we have really bucked the trend in terms of children care. And I think that's largely to do with the family safeguarding model and, and all the time and effort and finance that we put into our early help and prevention services. We are anticipating, however, I think with children's, it's been a slightly different picture for to adults. So we are seeing what we were sort of describing as the tail of the pandemic starting to ramp up a bit for children's. And what we are also seeing is, although we haven't got many more children in care, the cost of placements for those children is um, really, really becoming incredibly expensive and also some of the need of those children who we won't necessarily have known before so you know I can think of a case recently where we've had very little two or three months involvement with the family not a long history and that child has gone right to the top of our um, placement need um, because of, of her difficulties um, and that's been very quick so we're seeing more of that acute need but you're absolutely right we haven't seen kind of the increase in numbers we think we're going to see more as we go into the year and absolutely um send has been a massive pressure but i will pass the mic to john or possibly seamlessly thank you i, I think uh, lucy you're absolutely right the, the changing needs coming out of covid we really start to see that manifest in children young people uh, across the county uh, in terms of our general fund budget we've seen demand increase for our statutory assessment function and we've had to put additional capacity in i think we will need more uh, education psychologists are becoming more in demand particularly dealing with mental health challenges but equally in that statutory process uh, and we've also seen demand for transport increase and that complexity of need is requiring specialist placements further away so for the general fund we have that pressure uh, in terms of the uh, the DSG and the high needs block, uh, we continue to see increases in education, health and care plans and different needs coming through that we haven't experienced before. Uh, I think behaviour is something that is we need to address. Uh, we're having long conversations, our secondary heads at the moment about the need for permanent exclusion, the challenges around our BAPE arrangements uh, and the need to address, address those. But two other specific needs that we're seeing now that's slightly different. So inflation is one that's really starting to cause us challenges now. So whether that's placement costs or meeting needs of resources uh, and other challenges. Uh, but we are also seeing recruitment challenges around teaching assistants, uh, given that their roles are so important, but relatively low paid. It's very difficult to recruit at the current time, and that will lead to more costs. So we're monitoring that very closely. That will form part of our financial modelling. But it's right to recognise there is a real challenge around post-COVID and the implications of what came from COVID uh, and now the economic crisis too. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Taylor, next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm looking at page 28, 1.42. Um, 
talking about children in care. Um, it's saying that we've experienced increase in cost pressures due to changes in complexity of needs and continuing cost inflations within the sector. Um, what I want to touch on and understand is that it's saying that there's changes in the legislation from the 1st of September, so I'm guessing that was last year, um, which require the local authorities to ensure that no young person in care under the age of 16 were placed within unregistered provisions. Um, I just need to understand what that means. Um, so what were our children in care placed in if they were not registered um, and what the provision is now and where are these provisions registered? And obviously there is a cost implication and, and how, we're, how are we um, sort of mitigating that or looking at this cost with um, registered provisions now? So thank you. So, so I'll explain that. So the, the legislative change last September, and you're right, was last September, was that it became unlawful to place children under 16 in unregistered provision. So registered means with Ofsted. So um, it's a children's home or a fostering facilities are all registered with Ofsted and inspected by Ofsted. Um, and they say whether something's acceptable or not and has the same kind of rating um, as you do, as the local authority does, so, you know, inadequate, good, et cetera. And Ofsted has the power to close down registered provision. Um, and that's kind of the, you know, the, the safety net, if you like, for provision. Um, what has happened is that, and that's under 16, so you were never meant to place children under 16 in an unregistered provision, but it wasn't unlawful. And what changed in September is it became unlawful. 16 to 18 year olds, you're not required to place in registered provision. So you might do that. They might be in a foster placement, they might be in residential, but they might also be in a semi-independent provision. Um, and that's unregulated because there's no requirement for it to be registered. So, so those are the two different terms. Um, the, um, we try very hard and we very, very rarely place, if at all, children under 16 in unregistered provision anyway. Um, but if that has had to happen, that is a very expensive kind of provision because you have a lot of additional staffing and it's a bespoke thing that's arranged for an individual child usually. Um, the issue has been that what's happened is the placement market has shrunk because other local authorities did have some children in unregulated provision under 16. They've moved them, um, unregistered provision, they've moved them into the registered provision, which has just reduced the number of places available generally. And we have a real, because of the increases in children in care nationally, we have a real shortage of appropriate provision now. So there aren't enough placements for children in care nationally. And so when we're looking for a placement, even though we've got less children in care, we're having the same difficulty in finding a placement. Placements then charge more. It's a very simple um, sort of situation. We tend to be placing, particularly if we're looking at residential, we're placing children with greater need. Um, and so we're also paying for additional staffing. So the placement itself is more expensive. And then we're also now being asked for additional staffing to manage that young person. So you're then looking at an increasingly expensive provision. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what it's about. It's kind of a chain reaction. Thank you. Councillor Daunton, please. And thank you. We, we've heard before about the national shortage, and I think it's probably becoming endemic, partly people leaving because of leaving the workforce because of COVID, but also for other reasons. So are we able to look at the people entering the workforce? And are we having training programs for people entering the workforce and positively encouraging young people to join and in-house training as well? Um, that's exactly what we're trying to do. So I think um, we know, so um, you have to be a qualified social worker. The courses are usually around two years, although you can do a three year course as well. And there are various schemes that, you know, that, that encourage 
um, people who aren't qualified to um, fast track through those. And we are already part of some of those. And we also have partnerships with our local universities, Anglia Ruskin, for example. What and we've been doing that for some time, and we bring in um, newly qualified social workers and support them. And that was a very good pipeline for a long time. The difficulty is that because there's now no, or there are many fewer experienced workers moving round, there, the newer qualified workers are trying to fill all those spaces for all the local authorities. And we have a children's workforce problem, as John was alluding to, across. So it's not just in social work. So one of the things we, the new team and what I want the new project lead to do is to look at um, how we can design a model um, that's around growing your own and is much more effective and can um, build a pipeline that perhaps oversupplies. That's one of the ways that some authorities do it so that we can always make sure that we're replacing people um, before they leave and look at it like that. We offer apprenticeships, we've got various sponsorship schemes, but we need to really enhance those and develop them. So that's the plan, yeah. So I suppose I think this is particularly interesting and I'm just wondering how we could sort of perhaps take this out to schools and whether there would be any direct recruitment in you know, sixth form colleges and schools and making it um, a, a really attractive option for Cambridgeshire uh, school leavers to join Cambridgeshire County Council and maybe not necessarily in social work, but moving around training in house and moving into social work once they were in council employment. Sorry, John's going to say that. One of the teams that we are very lucky to still have within the, the County Council is a team that provides information, advice and guidance around careers. Uh, they are very tuned into this agenda. Uh, they are they organise and facilitate lots of career sessions and uh, you know, Nicholas teams are represented at those sessions and those forums. So we, we are reaching out. We're trying to, to make sure that the, the progression routes through, particularly with apprenticeships and other routes, we, we signpost young people into that area. I think it's it, it's an area I probably need to reflect on more around teaching assistants and things like that, given the pressures that we now have emerging there. But um, I think, um, I think you know, we have some good paths and some good uh, approaches to, to making sure that happens. But uh, clearly, there's more needed all the time. Thank you. Councillor King, please. Yeah, thank you, Nicola and John for Nicola mainly as well for holding forth and, uh, and, and the really important discussion on social workers. What I want to say is not a question, it's more of a comment to say we, we spoke a lot about vacancies and what we're doing to address. Uh, but I also want, hopefully, on behalf of all of us, um, all, all members and officers, to say how much we love and value our social workers. So uh, all you need to do is go scroll down in this list of, um, in, in the big pack of papers we have for the committee to read feedback from uh, and compliments from people about the work they're doing. It's the most amazing and fulfilling career, I hope, and just want to say that we are doing and hopefully will do more to make sure that it's the right environment it's uh, they're supported and they uh, you know they find it the right career choice with us in Cambridge so it's just in case any aspiring social workers or existing take time out of their busy busy schedules to watch this meeting live or, or, or later on thank you thank you uh, Councillor Bradnam please Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just another thought about people you might engage with. Um, my village of Milton links with uh, the village of Impington and other villages take part in the Connections Bus Project who provide youth um, activities for youngsters in this area. And I know that one of the very most popular courses they have there is in childcare and in um, looking after people. And I just think there is a, there's room there to actually support the Connections Bus Project and other youth projects like it with um, courses that give them a first step qualification towards looking after, and it might be older people 
or it might be young, you know, babies and young children. But that sort of takes children part of the way along a, a route that might take them into social care. So it's, um, I know that they've they've struggled during COVID as well because, of course, not being able to have youth clubs uh, because of distancing. But I know that they're coming back. You know, it's tried. It's hard to get those children to come back again. So um, offering courses that they find attractive is useful. And so if we can support them financially, that'd be fantastic. Just, just a quick comment on um, uh, childcare there. You mentioned another area of the workforce we're really struggling. Um, it, it's fair to say that we, we, we do a lot of work in this area. I'm very happy to pick up my, my teams about those pathways. Uh, we are one of the few local authorities accredited to deliver that childcare training uh, and to develop uh, staff through, particularly into degrees and apprenticeships, which will help the transition either into teaching, which you know, is one of the routes, but equally into social care as well. So I will pick that up and make sure that they are signposting and perhaps more linking up with Nicola around what we might be able to deliver locally. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Taylor, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'll be quick. Um, page 32, 5.1.1, it's on the table, um, children in care, in care placements. I'm just looking at the tier four step down. Um, we've got no budget for that, but in fact, um, we've got a snapshot number of placements of two. So it has actually created um, a, a cost. So I'm just, I'm just trying to understand why we've got no budget, but we are, we have got a cost within that. Whereas some of the others on this chart haven't got a budget, but it hasn't caused a cost. Yeah, so just very simply, obviously when we set the budgets at the start of the financial year, we base it on the, the kind of estimated numbers that we're gonna get in those specific areas. So you're right, in some instances, you'll see there are quite big variances between the differences and obviously the tier four at the time, we weren't anticipating that we would have to, to incur those costs as we went through the year. Just so happened that we we did um, get two two young people um, at, at various points during the year in, in that particular instance. So for all of these instances, I say the budgets are set based on trend data um, at a point in time. In reality, there are going to be variations from that as and as and when the needs of, of young people come to fruition throughout the year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, with this, we're asked to uh, review and comment on the report, which I think we've done in full. Thank you, officers, uh, for answering all of those really important questions. Item six. Item six is the finance monitoring report for May 2022. So Martin will ask you to stay with us and introduce this item. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so this is the first report um, of the new financial year uh, 22. So this gives us the position to the end of May. As you'll see, there's there's very little um, activity so far, and we're, we're um, forecasting a very very small um, overspend at the current time on the non-DSG elements of this. I don't think there's really too much detail on on that element at the moment. Uh, the, but one area I did want to draw your attention to was the uh, changes to the capital programme budgets. Um, so this um, Appendix C highlights all the changes from the original um, business plan. Um, these went to uh, strategy and resources last week for approval, but they're just for you to, to note those changes for the projects which, which specifically come under the remit of this, of this committee. Thank you. Thank you. So if I uh, open the report to questions from committee, please. Councillor Bradnam. Thank you. Um, and in fact, that's just exactly what I wanted to ask about. And that was um, Water Beach Newtown Primary uh, School listed in the changes from the 2023-22-23 business plan capital budget on page 111 of our agenda. And it refers to slippage from 2023 to 2024 due to redesign. And I'm just wondering, what caused sorry it's a it's a, um, a planning question rather than a financial one obviously if it needed to be changed then that's important but I just wonder what caused that redesign um, so it's going to be built as straight three form entry and three early years and I'm just trying to remember what it was originally planned as and what caused the change uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, Councillor Bradman, I don't have that detail. I'm very happy to get you a briefing note to explain uh, why that figure has moved, moved on. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Um, so with this, if there are no further questions or comments, uh, we're asked to vote on this. We've been asked to review and comment on the report and note the changes to the cat capital programme budgets from the business plan as summarised in Appendix C for approval by the Strategy and Resources Committee, which we have done. Um, so unless I see any hands, we'll take that as read. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Item seven. Item seven is the proposed approach for developing capacity in school placements for children with special educational needs and disabilities. Uh, Fran Cox isn't able to uh, join us today, so uh, Jonathan is going to introduce this report for us. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the role Fran has on the assistant directors had in this report, uh, but also Claire Cook, uh, who has done the detail work behind this. Uh, I think it's a significant role we need to be aware of. This is a new role around SEND sufficiency and planning. Uh, and I think the report shows the quality uh, and progress we are making to uh, ensure that we have good plans in place and can meet uh, the needs of SEND across our county. Um, just very briefly covering the key aspects of the report, uh, obviously I've been reporting to you at the last three meetings around the demand for new places. Uh, we've updated the figure around uh, children that will be requiring specialist provision moving forward. Uh, that number continues to decline. We are seeing some ups and downs across the county and we will expect to spike in that provision uh, in the autumn. Um, but 1.10 of the report and Appendix A outlines the progress that is happening in terms of uh, delivery of schemes. Uh, moving forward. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge, uh, again, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, traffic at the moment around the SEND green paper, which I previously shared with you. Uh, the government has announced further funding for local authorities around meeting the needs of SEND, uh, and the 14.5 million that's outlined in 2.1 of the report will help deliver our aspiration uh, around additional places uh, and meeting need, both in the medium, short and long term. Uh, I'd also acknowledge uh, that's not fully outlined in a report, the safety valve process we're currently going through in terms of additional funding to address some of the deficits you've seen in the previous two reports. Uh, part of that will also allow us to bid for capital at the end of this month uh, for additional uh, capacity uh, that is needed in the system. Uh, I have to say progress is moving rapidly. Uh, I very much welcome the visit I had with Councillor Hoy and Councillor um, uh, good lift to, uh, to, to Wispeach. Uh, we looked at two schools that will be supporting that aspiration moving forward uh, and strong engagement from leaders in our schools to, to make that reality happen. You know, the care and passion that sits behind them wanting to do the right thing was very apparent uh, from that visit, uh, particularly around Medigate uh, and the additional capacity uh, we will be creating there. Uh, but the progress is, uh, whilst good, the challenges still remain and this report outlines uh, the various steps we're going through. Um, I did want to highlight in 2.22 of the report the, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, we are continuing to look at how we are inclusive in our system. Uh, I wrote to head teachers recently asking for expressions of interest around enhanced resource provision uh, to go on individual school sites so we can meet locally SEND needs, uh, obviously ad addressing some of the concerns from Councillor Hoy's motion uh, in full council uh, around transport uh, and that need going forward. Uh, and the response has been incredibly positive. One of the rec recommendations in this report is the, uh, the, the, the adjustment to our specification for new schools to include a specific room or provision of space within all new builds to enable those on-site units, uh, which will meet specialist needs to being all new uh, primary school provision uh, in, in the county. Uh, and we will also consider secondary specs going forward for, for that provision too, uh, as, as we move forward uh, to meet those needs. Uh, we have included a section on transport there. Uh, um, we are committed to provide uh, members of this committee some training uh, around how transport works and the oversight of it. Uh, and we will bring back to you in October some policy uh, changes that we are suggesting. Um, but I have to say, addressing the distance young people are traveling to access education, we hope will be resolved through additional capacity at a local level. Uh, and we are doing work uh, to address that through this process. The, the final part I wanted to highlight was around uh, the additional uh, SEND uh, uh, area special school that we're proposing in Fenland uh, in March principally. Uh, we are intending submitting as a local authority a, a bid uh, to, to access funding for that school. Uh, and I, I hope I have your support with moving that forward uh, as part of our proposals. Uh, it is geographically a critical location for us. 
and will meet the needs of the Fenland community, but also other parts of the, the, the central area of our county, which is much needed. So um, I hope that's a useful oversight. I'm very happy to take any questions on, on the very detailed report I've submitted to you. Thank you, John. And uh, knowing how much pressure every single space in a school is under, having that additional send space, I think will make a really big difference, particularly in our new schools. Um, I have Councillor Thompson first, please. Thank you, John. Um, really pleased to hear about the new schools, this extra space. Obviously, you know, as part of North Snow, we're going to have six more primary schools being built there over the next 10 years. So it's really good to hear. I just want to understand what this all means for teachers. Um, obviously, teachers are expected to adapt every single um, lesson to support all the different ranges of STEM. So, um, will there is there talk of extra staff? How they would be upskilled? Sorry to say, use that word. Um, and also, you mentioned the recruitment problems that we have in TAs, and skilled TAs are really, you know, this is what we need for SEN students. Um, and the last point really is to understand. Could we actively recruit male T TAs? I think we need a bit of diversity in our TAs. Um, I don't know how one does that, but it's a question. Thank you. Thank you. I think some really relevant questions in there. So um, when we establish this provision, we will fund it. It will be treated as a specialist provision uh, and there will be part of our new banding system. It's one of the areas we proposed in our transformation program around making sure we accurately and appropriately fund that so that will enable teachers uh, TAs with particular skills and support to be put in place to make sure that's happening that's one of our commitments around it um, in terms of training again that's been part of our action plan so uh, schools forum gave us 2.1 million uh, extra money this year to support skilling up our workforce the green paper has made it very clear the expectation of mainstream schools will increase so part of our role and responsibility is to make sure training is is in place um, as we sit here now, there is a, uh, a conference going on that my teams are leading around uh, SEMH needs, social, emotional, mental health needs, and providing skills for trainers. I did go on there earlier, there's over 200 people attending that session uh, live at the current time, and I'll be closing it this evening. So uh, it's, uh, it's a really important part of what we need to do to make sure uh, that knowledge and understanding is there. I think the TA issue is interesting. It's something I'd like to bring back to you uh, with, with uh, some proposals around the, the, how we move this forward. Um, I think it's quite a complicated situation. I think there is a recruitment issue in this area. I think we have an issue around pay that we need to address. So uh, we operate a job family for TAs uh, across the county. That needs to be updated. That hasn't been changed for many years. I think that's one way we may be able to unlock uh, and support uh, colleagues going forward. So I've been speaking to HR about that uh, and our pay scales apply across all schools in the county. So it's important we get that right to make sure we can attract and deal with some of the retention issues. Uh, and again, in terms of diversity, absolutely. That is going to be one of the areas of focus. Uh, we, we do have male TAs, but I think we, we, we should be looking more broadly at everyone to see who we can encourage uh, and uh, sell the virtues of what is a fantastic profession uh, and one that will create lots of opportunities, but nonetheless is a very rewarding career. So we're going to do some work on that. and I'll happily bring back a paper if that's helpful around the position uh, and how we intend moving it forward. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm very encouraged that we're making such positive provision um, for the next five to 10 years uh, in Cambridgeshire. And uh, we know that this has been a, of concern. So I'm really glad that we're uh, grasping this and, and uh, making plans for it. I just wanted to ask whether um, academy schools are being asked to make the same provision or or would they anyway um you know are they making their contribution to this need as well uh, absolutely they're equally as part of the system uh, the offer has gone out to all of the academy schools uh, and to be really clear all the new primary schools that will open will be academies too so th there's no differentiation we're, we're seeing lots of great offers come from all sorts of different areas uh, and it's one where we're very much in this together. That's the view that SCN is everyone's business, which is our strap line in our strategy. Uh, and I, I don't see any differential between uh, mainstream uh, maintained and academies in this particular area. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hay, please. Sorry, I didn't realise I'd changed my name. <laughs> um, 
Thank you for the report, Jonathan. I do have a query under 2.25, though. Um, you mentioned, which I was very pleased to see, that officers are re recommending amending the standard specification of new build primary schools to include an additional send space. I was therefore a bit perturbed when later on in the same paragraph, it only mentions a commitment to prior prioritizing inclusion within secondary schools. If we're recommending amended standard specifications for primary, why not also secondary schools? Um, I think uh, there is a time delay in, in us delivering new secondary schools at the moment. We're not commissioning any. Um, I think there is some discussions needed with uh, how the model would work in that provision. You know, it's, it's not a class. We've got cabins already operating across the county that are much, much larger spaces. So uh, I think that commitment to include is there. I think what we haven't done yet is specify exactly what that will mean. Uh, and it's our intention to work on that. But uh, again, you know, having spoken to secondary colleagues uh, about the offer out around enhanced resource provision in existing schools, we've had a strong response from secondaries to do that. So I think it's tightening up some of what we think is needed as opposed to necessarily we want to do this because we absolutely do. Thank you for that. And just one further thing, within the report under 2.28, you mentioned ERBs. So what my one big bugbear is acronyms where there's no explanation of what it actually means. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we would have mentioned that earlier, but enhanced resource bases. So these these are our separate provision run by the school, supporting children from the local area, not necessarily from the school. Uh, and we will commission those places uh, to place those children and have oversight to them. So it's about making sure there is a local offer as opposed to necessarily traveling off to an area special school when needs can be met. Obviously, there are times when that specialist need means a child does need to, to go elsewhere. So apologies, that wasn't clear. Uh, we will I will make sure that is picked up in future reports. Councillor Hoy, please. Yes, thanks. You I just wanted to um, thank obviously yourself and Jonathan for coming out last week. It was a really useful exercise. Um, and it was good to kind of show everyone the local area and the problems that we face. Um, and also thank you for agreeing. Obviously, I had put an amendment in, but obviously you were kind enough to um, incorporate that into the report. So it was sort of a cross party thing. Um, so that was really useful as well. So just want to thank you both for that, really. Um, it's great that we're committing to that. Hopefully we'll see um, some action. I know obviously things do take time, but we do need um, a lot of resource in that area. So hopefully it's a positive step forward. Thank you. Councillor Daunton, please. Um, uh, uh, 2.14 to 2.1617. Um, I, I picked up from, and thank you for a really interesting report. Um, I've picked up a, a concern or an issue around post-16 provision. Um, and it's quite sort of clearly laid out here, but also I think some sort of underlying worries as well. Um, I just would like you to talk a little bit more about that, please. Yeah, um, post, post 16, obviously we go all the way to age 25. Yeah, it's, it's a challenging area. Um, we, we want to make sure children's education needs are met, their social care needs and their health needs continue to be met. And uh, I think one thing we strive to do is make sure there is appropriate provision in place. Um, that does not necessarily mean education in a school setting through to that, that time. What we're trying to do is make sure there is a range of offer. We want to make sure that we can transition these young people through into different types of environments, different arrangements where their needs allow. Uh, and we aim to seek uh, you know, that pathway through into essentially into adult social care at that time. So uh, looking at different routes, uh, you know, the suggestion here is around how we work with the college. Uh, is there a satellite there? You know, what we have found is that the jump between a special school, which is you know, very supportive, high staff ratios into a college can sometimes be too big for some of our children and young people. So this is an attempt to look at that pathway. Can we do something different? Should we offer a base that's run by the special school, which has similar feel to a special school, but is on a, a, a post 16 provision with a view that eventually that young 
young person will transition through into the college uh, with all the skills and confidence they need to succeed but what we are you know really trying to work through is how best we do that and um, you know these are very much pilots we're looking at different models to do that uh, to make sure parents are reassured that their children's needs will be met but it's a it's a really tough area to get right um, what we don't want to do is make sure that when a child gets to 25 there's a huge cliff edge in their provision we need to gradually provide appropriate support for, for that child and, uh, and that family to make sure they are confident moving into adult social care. Yeah, thanks very much. I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's a very, very difficult transition. Um, going back to the previous discussion, are you having difficulty recruiting people into this area? In terms of special school? Um, yes, we do. Uh, the teacher training in this area is, is, is not probably geared up in the same way. So um, I am having conversations with our, our, our teaching school hub uh, about more support we could put in place to, uh, to, to deliver in this area. Um, it, it's, it's a vocation and a profession, I think, working in a special school. So uh, we, we, we work really hard to, to, to share experiences. We, we find that the staff are so passionate about what they do. We need to make sure that that supply is there to continue to go, particularly as we've seen particularly in the last 10 years, the needs in special schools are very, very different. So that upskilling, that training we've already mentioned, that ongoing CPD and commitment to our staff is really key. I have to say our special schools take this very, very seriously and have good programmes in place and we, we contribute towards those. Thank you. Councillor Taylor, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, noting that uh, Samuel Pepys Special School is in the current capital programme for an additional 63 places, um, on Appendix A, um, just um, need to understand why it's not actually on the Appendix A with Send Awaiting Replacements Capital Programmes 22 to 25. Yeah, that's um, that's because it's already in our capital program. Um, so these are these are new uh, areas new we're looking to move forward. So it's already in the ex existing capital program. Thank you, Councillor Nessinger, please. I must have put my hand up. Um, I have a very quick question, <laughs> which is that there's a figure uh, which shows the increased rates. I'm just trying to find it now. Um, it, of the various different districts, um, including Peterborough. Um, and I was actually really interested at the low levels of SEND in Peterborough and the low levels of the predicted increase. Um, so if you could try and explain why that's so different between our districts, I'd be fascinated. <laughs> I think that's quite a challenging one to do. Um, we, we do. we do notice a trend in Cambridgeshire between the De uh, areas with high levels of deprivation and those with lower see a higher prevalence actually in those with lower deprivation which goes against some of the national uh, uh, situations and, uh, and where we do so particularly in the south of the city the prevalence is higher uh, we don't know why that is is that adam brooks is that uh, is that parental aspiration is it other factors that sit behind it um I think I think there are a range of issues where the families understand the system. You know, one of the things that and we've mentioned pinpoint already, we're encouraging them to make sure needs are identified. We're asking schools to identify those needs earlier. Um, sometimes there is underrepresentation in these figures, and that that's challenging. And uh, you know, I think if you, if you look at the Fenland line, that's relatively low, but we actually know the need is relatively high there. So um, you know, that's where some of these these forecasts are quite difficult to work through and to understand. Um, but we are obviously proactively working with schools and particularly early year settings now to make sure those needs are met and identified as early as they are. But it, it's really difficult. You know, we do make sure things like the Elo Cloffer is out there. Parents know that they can access that support if they need it uh, lots going on nationally around that that profile but uh, i do think we probably have some under representation and probably some over representation too in these figures thank you count sorry councillor king please thank you chair um john i have a sort of high level question uh we know the need is is great and high but it's also urgent so looking at the papers we have capital projects which um, have a timeline of delivery of school places and non-capital projects and my kind of very high level question is 
do you think, in your opinion, we're doing enough on the non-capital projects? Do we look under every stone to find opportunities to create places in the shortest time possible to satisfy the need as soon as possible? And uh, kind of looking, encouraging you and looking forward to, um, to seeing that list grow and uh, seeing more kind of opportunities there, thanks. Uh, I, th I think we've done a lot. So there's some examples in there, for instance, the, the Castle Special School using space at the fields uh, to create more capacity quickly. Um, got a similar scenario with uh, Medigate to do that. Uh, we undertook a, a review of our estate. That's all our estate, including council assets, academies, uh, and uh, uh, maintained schools to see where we were below PAN. Uh, we have had conversations with an awful lot of stakeholders around you know, you can do more with this, you can pick up those areas. So um, we are moving that forward. I, I would guard against rushing into this. There is some organisation needed. We've had to look at the things like the uh, service level agreements, uh, the commissioning arrangements to make sure they're in place uh, and delivering uh, solutions that suit the, 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 the county. Um, lots of schools would like provision on their own site to support their children in their school. Actually, what we need is a local solution where all children have the right to access that. We can't sustain and afford a unit in every school. What we can do is look at the local area and support that. So that's why we've had to carefully uh, navigate our way through this. Um, but we are moving forward and you know, I'm getting approached daily. Uh, I look at this report with my colleagues every month to say where we are and I'm pushing incredibly hard to accelerate as many of these schemes as we can. So uh, we have to approach it carefully, but we are trying to bring as much forward as possible. Thank you. I think that was everyone who indicated to speak. Um, so if we move to the report recommendations, co-opting members of the committee are eligible to vote on this report. The committee is being asked to A, approve the proposed delivery approach aimed at meeting demand for SEND placements, B, to approve an amendment to the current specification for new schools to include 55 metres squared of additional SEND space up per 2-4 entry school as standard. And then C to consider the feasibility study for a new area special school in Fenland, uh, which will return to CYP committee once complete. All those in favour, please. Thank you, Rishanda. I think that was uh, unanimous. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Item eight. Item 8 relates to the Family Safeguarding Service and Nicola Curley, our Director of Children's Services, will introduce this report. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Sorry, let me just get my thing up. Um, so this is hopefully quite a brief um, item, which is just asking committee really to agree an extension to the Bernardo's grants agreement for our um, domestic abuse victim support workers as part of our family safeguarding model, but also to enter into a section 75 agreement with um, CPFT, so Cambridge and Peterborough Foundation Trust, to deliver the adult mental health practitioners to the family safeguarding model. Um, so I can talk through that a bit more if people would like, or I can just take questions. Thank you. Any questions, comments, please? Councillor Hay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question uh, to do with 2.32 and 2.33 on page 135. It mentions that the grant awarded to Bernardo's does not qualify as a subsidy, and therefore there is a risk of challenge, albeit only low. Are there any other providers that we could uh, look to getting um, quotes from that would fulfill the subsidy level? So I, I think the issue, because um, I did um, talk this through with um, commissioning colleagues at the time, we did take legal advice on the matter as well. So I think the issue is that the family safeguarding monies are a grant. So they, they came from government. So the 4.1 million is a grant. And as part of that, um, the Department <coughs> for Education did ask us that we would work in partnership um, with people rather than with service suppliers. 
Um, and so we were asked to look at who existing partners were and Bernardo's obviously already deliver a contract for us around um, domestic abuse. Um, so it was felt that they would be appropriate. They also have experience, not that many people have experience in the family safeguarding model, and they had already worked in that in Peterborough. So we felt that they were the best people at the time. Um, we think this is a low risk. So obviously it's in there because it is, it is a risk and we do need to be um, transparent with the committee, but we do think it's a low risk. If we look to another provider, we are looking at, I need my glasses again, um, another 20 months around procurement. So we would need to extend the existing um, arrangements for, you know, essentially for another two years, which is, you know, is equally risky really because they're not properly formulated and we do need to take things forward. So I think the, the advice, and, and certainly I was happy to support that from both legal and commissioning colleagues is that Bernardo's was, was A, the right partner because of their skill and experience, but also the practical partner because of the really significant delay in, in getting somebody else. Thank you. Councillor Daunton, please. Um, yes, thank you. I want to support um, the provision of the um, adult mental health practitioners through the Section 75 agreement. I'm a county appointed governor on CPFT, um, and this is much valued, and I provide a short report to each um, governor's meeting on the action. Thank you. Any uh, Councillor Hay, um, Hoy, please. Sorry. Sorry. Um, just a slight thing. It's a little bit of a moan, um, unfortunately, but this is not the first paper where we've had. I mean, I'm not against it in principle at all, but um, when we're talking about this Section 75 agreement, we've literally got a paragraph and a half about what it is and, and the detail behind it. And it's similar to SNR. We're getting papers for nearly a million pound decisions with such little detail. And I just don't know really how transparent that is. And I, perhaps not a comment for you, I don't, maybe more of a wider comment, but I just, I just a concern really that this is happening quite frequently. Um, so, so I apologise, Councillor Hoy, it, it's certainly not intended to, to look like that. I think from, from our perspective, we have an existing seven, Section 75 long-standing arrangements with, with CPFT. And when we originally entered into the family safeguarding model, I don't know if people recall, but we were told, I think, you know, about two days before we were meant to launch that we'd actually got the money. Um, and so we were sort of uh, moving really quickly. And also, obviously, we, we then went into the pandemic. We went into lockdown, I think, about four, four weeks, three, four weeks after we launched the model. Um, and so we, what we were doing was piggybacking on the back of the adult Section 75 agreement to originally bring um, seconded staff in. Now, the advice I had um, from commissioning was that that actually wasn't um, perhaps as transparent and clear as it ought to be. And so what we ought to do, and, and also be very specific, what we ought to do for children's is have our, a separate agreement that really set out the clarity around what we were asking for, why and how long it would work. So what we've actually done is tried to create something that, that's more open and clear um, for people. But I appreciate we could have put that in a bit more detail in the report. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, thank you. Councillor Daunton, please. Yes, I'd like to take up uh, Councillor Hoy's uh, comment. I think it really would be quite helpful to have a more explanatory note on exactly what a Section 75 agreement is and how it works and the county's role and, and the role of the, the other parts of the agreement. So I'm sure we can put together a briefing note for committee on, on that generally, because um, it, it applies to adults as well. So we can do that if we can send that round. That's absolutely fine. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nicola. That's really helpful. And my feeling about this paper was it's really important um, money to spend. And uh, this seems a very sensible way of spending it. Um, but we mentioned earlier on that the numbers of uh, children in care has reduced. And I think you mentioned in response to an earlier question that part of the reason the numbers had not increased as we thought they might following pandemic was because of the investment that we had made in early care and early help and this family safeguarding model. And so I just wanted to get a feel for 
that perhaps the, the, the value of this is in protecting families before children need to be taken into care. And so perhaps this helps us as a council um, in that way, that it actually manages the situation before we get into crisis uh, in a way that makes us able to plan long term much better than if children were going into crisis. Have I, uh, do I, have I made that clear? Yes, I think you have, Councillor Bradman. So I think there's two different elements to, to, I think, what you're asking about. So, so the first is our early help provision, which is very much early help. So we're, we're trying to um, intervene and, and support families. And, and you're going to hear a bit more in a minute um, from the Family Hubs model, which hopefully will make that a bit clearer. Um, that we're trying to work with um, children, young people and their families before they even meet the threshold for social care intervention. And obviously, the more successful we can be at that, the better. Family safeguarding, though, I think you're absolutely right. It, it isn't a preventative service in the sense that we are, we are working with children who are already subject to child need plans or child protection plans, and sometimes even um, in public law outline or care proceedings. So these are quite high end children. But what we have found with the model, so the multidisciplinary model for people who aren't as familiar. Um, so a children's social work team working with mental health practitioners, domestic abuse practitioners who work both with um, victims and with perpetrators of domestic abuse, but also substance misuse, which hasn't come to you today, but drug and alcohol workers as well, is that we, we have been able to really significantly reduce the escalation of cases and hold children either at child protection level and then be able to start moving them down. And we have seen a you know, very, very significant decrease in the number of children looked after by Cambridgeshire. Um, and we see in some of the other local authorities, because there's a number around the country now with family safeguarding, where they're either sustaining placement numbers um, where, where other local authorities are, are increasing or bringing them down as well. But we've been particularly successful in Cambridge, you know, talking a couple of hundred children. It's a, it's a very significant shift. So, yeah, we, we think it's related to that. that. That was my feeling. And, and so it seems very money well spent. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this? Haven't missed anyone. Marvellous. Um, so if we move to the report recommendations, co-opted members of the committee are eligible to vote on this item. Um, I will take both together, I think. I haven't seen any dissension otherwise. So these are to agree an extension to the Bernardo's Grants Agreement to provide domestic abuse victim support workers for family safeguarding services and B to enter into a section 75 agreement with the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Foundation Trust to deliver adult mental health practitioners for the family safeguarding service um, within the action note having a briefing note on section 75 and, and understanding that. Uh, so everyone in favour please. Unanimous I think Rishanda thank you. Uh, that moves us on to item nine. Item nine relates to the Family Hubs Feasibility Study. I think Lisa Riddle is going to be joining us online. Uh, Lisa is the head of the service for the early help in the south of the uh, county. And uh, I think you're going to introduce this to us today. Welcome, Lisa. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm here today to seek agreement from committee to proceed with recommendations from a recent feasibility study um, to implement the family hub model of delivery across Cambridgeshire over the next two years. As outlined in the papers circulated to the meeting, family hubs were initially endorsed in the 2021 Leadsom Review, with the agenda gathering pace nationally since then. The model brings services closer together from pre-birth to 19 or up to 25 where there is SCND. For a, and this um, approach is through a network of hubs, outreach and an enhanced digital offer. The hubs are based upon three key principles of access, connection and relationships, and they further develop our current place-based model of delivery of child and family centres and early help. Communities are at the heart of the model, with families playing a critical role in shaping local support and services. In late 2021, the Department for Education awarded Cambridgeshire funding to conduct a feasibility study into the development of the Family Hubs model of delivery. 
The study took place earlier this year and involved rigorous consultation with 140 children, young people and their parents and 67 partner agencies, including statutory, health and voluntary sector organisations. It also included extensive research and input from the Anna Freud National Centre for Family Hubs. The recommendations before you today are based upon these findings and a significant level of support from families and from our partners for change. We're waiting currently for the outcome of a bid to the National Transformation Fund and have been confirmed as being on the long list with an outcome um, due in August. However, if we're unsuccessful in the bid, the cost of implementing option two from the study can be met from the service. And this is through an uplift to the current supporting families budget and through existing budget that's generated via external income. The Family Hubs model aligns fully with our best start in life and strong families, strong community strategies, as well as emerging national best practice. The proposals also align with our corporate priorities for children and young people, strengthening partnership, delivery and placing services in local communities. And um, Thank you for your time today. Um, I do hope that you'll feel able to support the recommendations in the report, which would enable us to commence implementation of the model from September. And I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Lisa. Any questions? Councillor Hoy, please. Yeah, um, just how would you say this is mostly different from the old children's centres? Because it sounds very, 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 very similar. <laughs> and remarkably similar. <laughs> So I just I wondered, uh, are there any differences? <laughs> Hello, Councillor Hoy. Thank you. <laughs> um, there are many differences, but I think it, it, you're really right to name that. Um, I think during the consultation process, it was one of the things that we tackled head on, that difference between family hubs and the old Shore Star offer. So the, the key change here is the age group. You know, we, this um, model is about 0 to 19 or up to 25. Shore Start was very um, enforced that the cutoff was, was at age five. So this is about whole family, whole system approach. Um, and it's a broader set of services as well. Um, I think traditionally Shore Start was very much focused on um, health visiting, midwifery and that kind of early year is early play approach and this is far more in depth it also aligns with some of the other national programs that we see come out of central government like reducing parental conflict and the national supporting families program so there's far more join up across the system and that's what makes it critically different to the previous program thank you i have councillor thompson please hello there thank you so much for your report can i just understand what kind of locations you're looking at are they going to be across Cambridge years. Yeah, so the, the model um, very much, um, our proposals very much build upon our current model of delivery, which is via a network of child and family centres and um, zones. So we hope to build upon that. We've had a lot of interest from partners as well about joining up. So these are place-based buildings um, in the five geographical areas of, of Cambridgeshire, so they're, they're spread across the whole county. Um, but we've also had, during the um, feasibility study, some preliminary conversations with colleagues in libraries, for example, about how we can best utilise our, our assets across the network. So very much place-based services. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, interesting that Councillor Hoy asked that question because I was thinking the same sort of thing and I'm, I'm very glad to see that actually it looks to me as if this, because it offers help to such a wider age range of um, young people and indeed their families, I think it will, um, it will be different. Um, but the other thing that we were aware of in children's centres was that some parents found it difficult uh, emotionally to visit because by definition, by going, it meant that they had a problem. And I remember we had long discussions about how to um, make those locations comfortable and safe and not a point of stigma for families. And I think actually in broadening the age range may in fact um, succeed in that because it it doesn't mean that it's parents with young babies who are having problems it's whole families who are seeking support 
Um, so that's one thing. And I just wondered if that could be commented on um, that, that feeling of being identified as somebody who needs help by virtue of actually going to a building, whether that will be um, addressed. And that might be when we were talking about children's centres, that was why we co-located them with libraries and community centres, because it meant it wasn't so obvious that that's where families were going. Uh, the second thing I wanted to ask about, and this is just is my ignorance, um, I just wanted to ask who are the partners who are um, going to help source funding, because um, it says on page 151, under the details of option two, governance and project management, to recruit personnel to lead the development of family hubs across Cambridgeshire, but to source funding for these roles from family hubs partners. So I wondered who those partners were. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the question. Um, so, I mean, the stigma point, first of all, I think is a, is a really valid point and it's something that I think um, is being grappled with nationally. Um, so in a lot of the national conversations about conversion to family hubs models, um, there are conversations taking place about how we change, how we market the offer, how we draw families in and reduce that stigma. And I think probably by... Um, the co-location that you mentioned but also by broadening the offer um that should help us to provide families with it as a safe place to go and a place which isn't a kind of stigmatized but it actually becomes as, as normal as going to the library or going to your gp or going into a school to to ask for support and advice so that's our ambition but yes we've got work to do in that area um, the, the other part of this as well is that although I'm very much talking about place based services and accessing communities, it is backed up by a digital offer but that also sets it apart from um, sure start and I think makes um, makes the support and the the information and advice accessible to a different set of people as well and outside of traditional hours. Um, the funding that the feasibility study mentions and the recommendations to um, to seek support from partners, uh, predominantly that would be public health and partners such as um, Cambridgeshire Community Services, um, who deliver our Healthy Child programme, who have been involved in this programme throughout. However, the proposal that I bring today about the, the funding of option two, we can source from um, internal current budgets as well. So anything else would be additional. And some of that has already begun. For example, um, the training offer that was proposed, um, we've, we've already sought funding from the partnership. So that's not that's not part of the paper today. Thank you, Chair. Um, that's interesting. I wasn't expecting you to come up with that answer. Um, I'm glad to hear that we're, you know, we're, we're already in the business of thinking about how we're going to fund these. But actually, one of the things I thought was this sort of provision could, uh, and given that we're hoping to take on somebody to seek funding, I would have thought um, local businesses might be happy to um, sponsor this sort of thing. And certainly in localities, you might well find that people's corporate social responsibility budget might actually be very happy to um, support this sort of provision. I know it, that doesn't mean it's there forever but I, I would have thought local local businesses would be happy to support this and could we explore that thank you um, my link broke up a little but I think that the question was about businesses supporting the funding um, and I, I think that's a really helpful suggestion and if committee um, approve the implementation today then I think that's certainly something that we could work with colleagues across the council to explore further in our links with local partnerships Thank you. Councillor Bulat, please. Thank you, Chair. I think it was really good to see such an extensive consultation being done in a relatively short short time. And I know personally some uh, local stakeholders in my division who really enjoyed being part of the, the consultation. So well done for getting so many views in such a short amount of time. Um, I actually wondered, based on, on this point, it seems that you already have quite a good and diverse group of people who are interested, who are part of this uh, uh, feasibility study. So I was wondering, how do you plan on keeping some stakeholders involved uh, throughout the process, whether there will be any plan around, around that kind of engagement? And I had a specific question 
around the point saying that uh, Cambridgeshire is not one of the 75 authority areas who are eligible for the funding from the spending review. So I'm just interested how were these 75 areas selected and whether we had any feedback why our, our county didn't qualify for that, uh, just out of curiosity, like how was that decision uh, made? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so the, the eligibility for the 75 top tier authorities who, who can access um, the Family Hubs and Start for Life funding was very much around deprivation levels, but also a rural urban classification. Um, so basically all of the authorities were ranked and unfortunately for Cambridgeshire, um, because of obviously our lower levels of debt deprivation we appear quite a long way down the list so even if authorities from the 75 drop out we are highly unlikely to become one of the 75 funded um, having said that um, I did mention the transformation bid um, in, in my opening and we are on the long list for that so 12 local authorities outside of the 75 will receive up to a million pounds transformation funding um, but we're still waiting the outcome of that decision it was or originally due to be announced in April but it's been delayed until August so we might see quite significant um, amounts of funding coming in through that if we're successful and the point about keeping families engaged um, in the sort of consultation and um, planning services I think is critical to this model it's a key part of the relationship and um, principle of the model and it's something that is um, a heavily heavy focused from the National Centre. So we know that that's something that um, not only do we need to do, but it's right to do for our communities. We've already got some of those structures in place um, and we'll, we'll continue to work those up, but probably through a family hubs model and in conjunction with our partnership. Thank you. Councillor Hoy, please. I was just going back to the old children's centre days. Um, I think part of the, there were some, obviously some bad things and some good things that happened when they closed. And I think one of the things that we identified at the time was there was in some areas, particularly the more affluent areas, people kind of almost using it as a thing to do because they were a bit bored in the daytime. Um, and there was less service provision perhaps in the areas where they actually really needed the essential service. Uh, so how do we, I suppose, make sure that doesn't happen again going forward? Because it'd be a shame to perhaps repeat mistakes that we should have learned from. Thank you. Um, I, I think that's a really um, valid point, Councillor Hoy, and something that we've worked really hard at, um, at correcting really over the last five years. So our outreach model um, is is much developed now we have a far greater presence in the communities that need us um, and a, a critical part of the family hubs model is developing outreach not only for council services but for our partner agencies as well so I think that's what pushes us to make sure that we're delivering in the communities that need the services rather than um, as you say it just becoming a place where families who maybe don't need that support can come to. Thank you. Although uh, I am aware that all families may well need support at times, but I uh, do understand the sentiment. Um, so if we can move to the report recommendation, co-opted members of the committee are eligible to vote on this item. The committee is being asked to approve recommendation two from the feasibility study executive summary report and proceed towards implementation over the next two years. All those in favour of this recommendation, please raise your hands. I think that's unanimous again. Thank you. Um, I propose at this stage we take a break until 12 o'clock and uh, we will reconvene at that point. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody, and uh, welcome back. This is item 10, which is the recommissioning of the translation and interpretation services. Uh, Helen Andrews is joining us. Helen Andrews is joining us today. Welcome. Uh, Helen is the Children's Commissioning Manager and Gavin Mullin, 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 Senior Commissioning Officer, is also going to join us online. Um, I think, Helen, you're going to open the report for us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, um, Capita Translation Interpre Interpretation Services um, currently are provided to Cambridgeshire County Council. Um, this contract with Capita expires on the 7th of November this year and needs to be reprocured. Uh, in section 1.2, I've listed the types of translation services Capita provides and briefly described in 1.3 how council offices uh, book translation services through Capita systems. Main issues uh, are described in section two, and these are about the annual spend, uh, our usage, and the challenges the language service market is facing. Spend on the provision of translation services is rising each year and is dependent on national and local factors, often outside of our control. Um, our annual spend for 21-22 was over £142,000. This is a 22% rise on the previous year, and chart one shows the rising trend. In 2.1.1, looks at um, the factors contributing towards this. Uh, in terms of usage, children's social care are the biggest spenders and main users of translation and trans translation and interpretation services, accounting for about 87% of spend. Table shoot two shows uh, children's social care spend compared to other council directorates. Um, the average spend within social care is approximately £2,409. Um, this reflects the volume and the complexity of many of the cases that they're dealing with. The third issue on the UK language market, uh, it, it is the, the largest or was the largest interpreting market in Europe uh, with over 16,000 language service providers. Um, however, um, Brexit uh, is having uh, an effect on language service providers, notably difficulty acquiring new translators and the loss of work as clients and translators have moved away from the UK. Section three sets out the procurement process for the new contract. As this is a large provider market, there are several public sector language service frameworks that list 20 to 30 language providers on each framework. And, and I've um, given you some examples there. Providers on these frameworks uh, are already quality checked uh, while their pricing is standardized. Um, so the frameworks um, reduce the time and the resources spent on commissioning and procurement activities, and they are compliant with our contract regulations. Um, a collaborative recommissioning and procurement approach between Cambridge County Council and Peterborough City Council has started, but at the end of the procurement, each authority will have separate contractual arrangements. Um, in terms of timeframes, uh, the Joint Commissioning Board uh, agreed that the framework approach offers the best value for money. Um, uh, so we will direct award from the framework uh, in October so that a new contract can start on the 8th of November. The total value of a four-year translation interpretation service is uh, 5,608. 568,728 pounds. Uh, this is, is in excess of the 500,000 pound threshold, hence is a key decision. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to add anything, Gavin, or? No, oh, brilliant. No, thank no, you very much. Point. All right, thank you. Um, Personally, I'm really pleased to see the uh, deaf, blind, and uh, sign language interpretation on there as an extra, as a part of this service. Um, can I ask, do we also offer um, voice to text type interpretation services? As someone who's uh, late to deafness and now registered profoundly deaf, um, 
I'm still not learned sign language. So having a system which would turn voice into text, um, obviously is the kind of system that I would use. Is this something that we also offered through the translation service? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, Gavin, I'm just wondering if Capita have had any dis discussions about that with us? It's not something that we've discussed with, with our existing provider. Um, we haven't had teams come and specifically ask us for, for a service like that to this point, but it's definitely something that we can have a conversation with. Um, and when we've had previous conversations with, uh, with our current provider around um, doing things like um, videos instead of doing some other things for people who are uh, having certain issues, they've been really flexible and willing to work with us to achieve whatever the goal is that we have. So I'm sure that they would be able to, to put something in place if that was something that we require. Brilliant, that's uh, really interesting to find out. I know I use the uh, captions on Zoom and Teams and I get some very interesting interpretation from some of the words at times, um, which does add to amusement during meetings. Um, but yeah, it'd be good to, to know if this is a possibility going forward. Um, opening up to the committee, any questions or comments? Councillor Bulat, please. Thank you, Chair. I had a couple of points on, uh, first of all, on Ukrainians uh, who are welcomed in, uh, in our county. I was wondering if we have sufficient provision in terms of the, the language services available, especially considering that everywhere across the county will be, and, and the country will be needing uh, those, uh, those languages. I was wondering how does the level of provision look like in terms of supporting Ukrainians, uh, specifically with the languages that uh, some of them may, may need. Uh, uh, and then secondly, I was wondering if there's, uh, you have it listed in the report, the kind of first two um, main need languages, uh, Lithuanian and Polish. I was wondering if there's like a full list of kind of like the top, all the languages that are being requested, because it would be interesting to match whether it's kind of an indication of just the, um, which are the largest migrant groups or whether there are like specific needs in some, uh, some migrant groups. So in other words, is it that just because we have uh, the predominantly largest groups are, for instance, Lithuanians, Polish, Romanians, and so on, and we need more language provision in those groups, or are there specific groups with more language need than others? It would be just interesting research-wise to, to know that. Thank you. Um, certainly at the moment, um, we are managing with the number of requests that we are, that Capita is receiving for, for um, uh, Ukrainian um, uh, language support. Um, as, as I explained in the paper, quite often the translators themselves are freelancers and they will work for multiple um, providers. Um, so um, there are times when uh, it's not always possible to get uh, a translator at a specific time, but generally, um, overall, um, Capita have been um, really excellent uh, at at least having an alternative, i.e. having it by telephone um, or rather than face-to-face. -face. Um, so at the moment that hasn't been an issue, but yes, it, it could be. Um, your second question about the, the a list. Um, yes, absolutely. We've only listed the top three here. Um, uh, so we can give you a list, uh, certainly of the top 10, but we can look further to see. Uh, and and that, that, that does change. Uh, obviously, this goes back to the previous year rather than the current year. Thank you, Helen. Councillor Netsinger, please. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Sorry, it's fine. Um, about the use of framework um, procurement arrangements um, and the fact that that, that, that choosing to use that will to a certain extent restrict the type of organizations that we're um, expecting to procure this from because if they're part of that framework they're quite likely to be only a very large sort of national level organization um, uh, so I don't know I mean it may be that within those frameworks there are smaller more local um, providers included um, but if not um, is, is it um, have you looked at all at uh, doing so anything outside of the framework process? And I realise that there are tight timescales for it, but it would be interesting to know. Most of the providers are uh, on frameworks. That, that seems to be the norm. Um, 
but also because they can give us uh, the range of languages that we, that we need rather than just um, the, the top three or four. Um, uh, so sometimes the, the, the larger organizations um, have got this, this huge range of, of language, but they're also offering us much more administrative type support in managing the issues. Uh, in terms of local providers, um, I'm not aware uh, of a, a specific Cambridgeshire um, uh, um, uh, translation service. Um, they do tend to be um, more national ones. Um, and certainly all uh, the providers on the frameworks are all quality checked. The prices are all standardized. Um, so we, we have assurances that they are uh, uh, quality providers. Um, if we were recommissioning, we would have to literally um, go through. The frameworks offer, also offer us the opportunity of, of comparing our usage with what each of the providers, and often there's 20 or 30 providers on each single framework. So the, there's five frameworks that I've listed. Um, um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at well over 100 uh, different types of um, language service providers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Maguire, please. Thank you. Um, and my, my question is similar to Councillor Singer's, but in, in paragraph three, where you give the five examples of providers, one of them is ESPO. And I'm just thinking in terms of our relationship with ESPO, we're a partner in ESPO, aren't we? So is there not some sort of financial benefit to us as an authority to, to go with ESPO if all, all else being equal? Um, yeah, well, we have to um, put in place a, it, it's still a procurement exercise. So it has to be transparent. It has to be open. It has to um, uh, be fair. Um, so we would, yes, we, we are getting all the data from each of the uh, framework providers so that we can, com can compare the case, the, compare their prices to see who offers Cambridgeshire County Council the, the best value. Um, uh, overall, um, and, and that that decision, um, once we've done all the comparisons, um, um, will be made based on on that uh, on our data and on our analysis. Chair, okay, well, I just come back on that? I understand that point of competitive bidding, and we've got to do it. We seem to be doing it properly. But if if one organisation, if we're part of an organisation, so probably doesn't always, does it always come down to the bottom line sort of thing? Is it, I mean, when our procurement exercise is doing, or are we able to give advantage to one of our own organisations? I suppose I'm, without putting you on the spot, you can see the point I'm making, hopefully. I, I, That's I, a procurement I, exercise, I guess. Yeah, yes, I, I'm not sure we, we could uh, give an advantage to, we, 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 we would have to carry out a, a proper exercise and, and make it fair. Otherwise we could be challenged and we could end up with the costs of, of a challenge if, if we um, have um, awarded uh, based on um, an existing relationship rather than uh, the data. If I can come back on that, I think we have to abide by procurement rules, even if there is an, an additional benefit with using something like ESPO. Um, but I'm happy to be put right by someone who's who's studied all of the law. Charlotte's agreeing with me, so it must be true. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a bit of a um, general question, but you've given us a range of the top three and you've referred to the top 10 languages needed and I wondered if you had any feeling and I'm not asking for data but just whether you had any feeling that the number that the languages that are most needed are they as a result of the proportion of that nationality as a proportion of our population or because the people of those nationalities in our communities are encountering more problems and thus coming to us with concerns because um, we need to be able to support those 
nationalities and families just as well as we would anybody else. And so I just wondered, is this just, um, it, it, what's the driver? Is it the nationality or the kind of problems they're encountering? Um, I, I mentioned that children's social care um, are the biggest users and within that our unaccompanied asylum seeking um, children uh, make up a, a large proportion. Um, so the, depending on their nationalities that, that uh, is a big driver uh, in, in itself. Um, uh, um, yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh, so with this one, we have two recommendations. Co-opted members of the committee are eligible to vote on this item. The committee is being asked to A, approve the recommissioning and procurement of translations and interpretation services, and B, to delegate responsibility for awarding a contract to the provision of translation and interpretation services starting on the 8th of November. 2022 to the Executive Director, People and Communities. With the consent of this meeting, I'd like to propose that we amend recommendation B to exercise the officer delegation subject to consultation with myself and the Vice Chair, which is standard practice. Um, we can also take this through spokes as well, of course. Um, if anyone objects to that though, can they say so now? No? So if we take both recommendations at once, if that's all right, all those in favor of both recommendations. Thank you. Thanks, Rashonda. I think that's unanimous. Thank you very much, Helen, and uh, thank you for being with us. Item 11. Item 11 is Children's Complaints and Feedback Team's Annual Report for 2021-22. Joe Schickel, the Children's Complaints Manager, is joining us remotely. Welcome, Joe, and uh, you will introduce the report to us. But before I hand over to Joe, I'd like to thank officers for bringing this report to us much closer to the end of the reporting period um, to ensure we have a chance at considering its findings in a timely manner. Um, this was requested by the committee in January when we considered the previous annual report and um, it's something we really appreciate you turning around in this time frame and uh, would like to continue going forward. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, committee. Um, uh, as you can see from my earlier circulated report, it's been another busy year. Um, but as you've already had sight of the report, I won't repeat the content in its full. Um, I'll just draw your attention to some of the highlights. Uh, you'll notice um, that the number of statutory stage one complaints has gone down. Um, in fact, there's been a 61% decrease. Now, that's not to say that the number of children's social care complaints have reduced, rather that we've continued to embed a new way of working following um, updated advice from the local government and social care ombudsman um, uh, that was released in March 2021. So we now deal with many of the previously received complaints from parents and carers about social care through the corporate process, um, hence the rise in that area. As a result of the change of approach, you'll note that the majority of stage one statutory complaints relate to children in care or care leavers, um, with 25, 25 of these complaints coming directly from young people. You'll also note that the, keen is really, that the council um, is keen to um, learn lessons and make service improvements as a result of these complaints. And you'll note from my report some of the improvements that we've made in this area. In relation to corporate complaints, the highest area being complained about relates to statutory assessment. Um, largely, these are around timescales and delay um, relating to an increase in demand on services. But I also ought to point out that the highest area of compl um, compliments that we receive also relate to this service area. However, you will be aware that the local authority has embarked on a SEND transformation programme, which John's spoken about earlier today, which includes the consideration of complaints relating to EHCPs, the annual review process, and how to effectively capture the parent and pupil voice in the improvement plan. Um, and we've been working with our colleagues in SEND services to provide them with information uh, that I know that they're actively looking at now. 
In the children's complaint and feedback team, we've also learned lessons from complaints and we've made several changes to our own ways of working as a result. And I've also highlighted these in my report. So thank you for your time today. And I'm happy to take any questions from the committee uh, that they might have. Thank you, Joe. So uh, I'll open the report to comments and questions. Councillor Thompson first, please. Thank you so much for the report. I have two questions. Um, one is I'm quite surprised to see um, for the EHCP that there's been no complaints about how many hoops the um, parents have to go through to actually get a plan for their children. And um, that's that I get that quite a lot locally. I've got one. I've got one particular resident who's taken three years to get her child to be assessed in any format. So that's number one. And number two, you've got a really great extensive list of um, learning themes um, and actions on your annual report. I'm just wondering how you will monitor that going forward. Are there KPIs going to be put forward? Because it'd be nice to have um, something back at the committee to say, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and what actions you've taken from there. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you for that. Um, in relation to your first point, and I'm sure John might want to chip in here, um, um, we do receive complaints about the needs assessment process, um, and they do constitute part of this bigger number that, that, that are listed, um, or you know, the data that's supplied in the annual report. Um, I can't say I've seen complaints um, relating to the needs assessment process taking up to three years, but we certainly do from time to time um, have complaints in relation to that timescale process. Um, in relation to KPIs and monitoring reports, then obviously we do keep a very close eye, um, but I think correct me if I'm wrong, that, that your point might have been with the service improvements that we make as a result of learning lessons from complaints. Are we seeing a reduction perhaps in certain areas? Um, are the types of complaints changing? Um, and that is something that we do continuously look at and perhaps could report on um, within our next report. Sorry, just to touch on that point as well, it's good to keep a theme of what keeps coming back. So based on the theme, what actions you're providing. So yeah, it is what you've said, but thank But you. completing that feedback loop of where, yeah. where complaints have been made, service improvement made, and yeah, I see. Thank you. Can I just come back on the EHCP issue? Um, we follow as a local authority, the uh, SCND code of practice. It prescribes the level at which we were, were required to undertake initial assessment of need. Uh, around those uh, that that's uh, the child's expectations we actually do more assessments than the majority of our local authorities so I think that's probably more a legal issue in terms of the code of practice rather than necessarily what happens locally although we are aware there are frustrations the there is a particular source through uh, but we do provide via the local offer guidance for parents on the appropriate approach and it's a parental entitlement to access that provision it doesn't necessarily need to be via the school Thank you. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so there's two things that I wanted to raise. One's general and one's more specific. Uh, so the general point is I'm interested by the format of this report. Um, and whilst it's, in other words, it's the balance between the, the um, compliments and the complaints and the way in which they're handled in the report. So just to summarize, we have 30 pages, which are wonderful of all the, com the compliments um, that have been received, which is lovely, but there's no analysis in the report of the areas around which our staff are doing particularly well. Uh, and yet on the complaint side of the report, there is no or very few in the way of quotes and it's all analysis. So I absolutely understand um, why you might, it might have been drawn up in this way, but I think it's unbalanced. And I think I would like to see more analysis of the compliments and more real words about the complaints. So that's just uh, to do with the format of the report. 
Um, but in my capacity as chair of the corporate parenting subcommittee, I'm interested in um, the narrative around points 2.5 to 2.8 on page 163 of our agenda, where you're talking about the complaints um, from children in care and care leavers. Now, firstly, all credit to our young people for raising their voices and um, that speaks well for their ability to be empowered to, to make a complaint. So good for them. Um, and I'm glad that they are doing so and using this route to raise their concerns, you know, a proper formal route to raise their concerns. But one of the things I notice in the paragraph 2.8 is common complaint themes raised by care leavers or children in care relate to setting up home allowance, um, leaving or care grant, the late allocation of a personal advisor, issues accessing junior ISA savings accounts, outdated pathway plans and delayed post-18 planning. Now, all of these relate to things happening later or having to wait longer for them. And for children, having to wait makes a difference. It happens, it, it, it makes a difference to all children but for, and young people. But for them, having to wait for something is worse than for us who know that years get shorter as you get older, for them having to wait might make a real difference to how they feel about their life, their future chances, their opportunities to become independent, their ability to be, um, you know, treated equally with other people. And I, I just wanted to know, as, as the chairman of the Corporate Parenting Subcommittee, you know, we hear from the Children in Care Council, and I want to be able to demonstrate to our young people who take the trouble to take part in that, what are we doing to address this? And I appreciate it might be short staffing, but can we just have some explanation of what causes those delays and what are we doing to try and address them and address those concerns more swiftly? Thank you. So I'll, I'll answer that one, Councillor Bradnam, because um, I think it's it's my service area. So I think we, we would all um, share your concerns and your views about that. Our, our young people leaving care are um, some of our most vulnerable um, young people, um, although obviously many are very successful as well. These are a small number of complaints. So um, overall, in terms of the number of our young people who do leave care each year. So there is an element of perspective in that. But there are indeed some themes around organisation and planning ahead. So I think one of the difficulties with our previous structure was that um, all children, young people were treated in care, were treated exactly the same. And there wasn't um, kind of a, a real, like a rec a recognizing that they were leave, they're about to leave care, that there needed to be a process, particularly from, well, it's actually from 16 and a half, but certainly from once you're into your sort of 17, 17 and a half, there needed to be very discreet and bespoke planning around that transition. And in, under our old system, you were kind of in there with a four-year-old and a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. So we now have, we've revamped our leaving care teams. They are much stronger. We have recruited um, into them. And I think people remember the last committee, we had a really helpful report with a number of recommendations, which we're taking forward. And I discussed last time. So there's still work to do. And I absolutely accept that. But we've remodeled the process so that you do have these young people have a personal advisor who is much more focused on the practical because this is about the practical stuff making sure that grants are applied for making sure that we've got applications into housing and things like that and that's that's all going forward there will always be some issues um you know with a with a big um a large number of um young people but we do think it's improving um and as you said i really value i would worry if i had didn't have any complaints um, so I think it's really important that we have some, obviously I don't want every child needing to complain about our services, but if we have none at all, that also implies to me that, that young people don't have a voice and don't feel able to talk about when things aren't going as they would like. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important that, that we've got that. And obviously we fund an advocacy service to make sure that they are supported um, to make complaints when they feel they need to. These are all resolved. 
So these are stage one complaints which are resolved and we usually resolve very quickly. So it isn't hopefully um, a long wait for, for young people to get something sorted. Um, but I agree, obviously, it'd be, it would be better if we were able to do it straight away. Thank you. And could I have a comment on the report format, please? Yes, yeah, sure. So I take your comments on board entirely. And you are right to an extent that the um, content of the annual report is very prescriptive by government guidance, what they want to see in the government report. And the complement report is something that we add as an extra. And obviously, we try and capture that to celebrate all the great work. That, that is being um, done and all, all the compliments and feed positive feedback that we receive. I think staff welcome the opportunity of seeing that too and, and it's something to be celebrated. Within my annual report, I do include uh, a section at 1.1 compliments that does give you a little bit of analysis around the functionality as uh, uh, the areas where the most compliments are received in relation to. And you'll see from that, that as I mentioned earlier, Send Services is the highest receiver of compliments. Um, but I do take on board your point about um, no quote, no quotes around um, complaints, and there could be more real words in relation to complaints to perhaps bring that alive a bit more and make it more real. So um, I'm grateful for that feedback, and it's something that I will look to improve on for my next annual report. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't see any further hands. No. So if we move to the report recommendation, this is uh, co-opted members of the committee are eligible to vote on this item and the committee is being asked to consider the content of the report and appendix and request a further report in 12 months. Can I take that as being approved unanimously? Yeah, thank you. So item 12. Item 12 relates to the additional public health funding for activities supporting children and young people in 2022-23 and beyond. Raj Lakshman, the consultant in public health medicine, in, uh, joins us to introduce the report. I think this is Raj's first uh, visit to our Children and Young People Committee, but she does meet regularly with Spokes and uh, with Maria and I as chair and vice chair to discuss ongoing public health and uh, its matters relating to children. So welcome Raj. Thank you chair and thank you to committee for inviting me. Um, this report is to highlight the additional public health investment from um, some of it from the deficit that we've had or underspend that we uh, that Martin talked about, and some of it as part of recurrent funding. Um, and, and it's for the committee to endorse this additional investment in children's public health. So uh, just as a background, the public health directorate, uh, we've heard from Martin's report, is funded from a public health grant, and about 9.4 million goes towards children's public health. Um, and in addition to some of the all age services as well. So this is additional funding, which we've um, asking a committee to endorse. And, and there are some areas that have been if affected a lot by the pandemic. Firstly, eating disorders. We've seen an increase in eating disorders and we want to fund uh, some training for early identification and management and support for families. And, and training for professionals as well. Um, and that is to identify early and prevent issues escalating, which would be good for the system and for children and young people. The second is to support families of children and young people who self-harm. Again, we've seen um, that um, there are high rates of self-harm in Cambridgeshire and we need to support the families in terms of um, while these children are waiting for CAMH assessments and also some of the stigma and a lot of heartache that families go through. The third is a public health manager post. We currently um, just three of us or less than three of us and we like to have additional capacity, especially with the children and maternity collaborative and the six strategies that underpin some of that work, which are highlighted in the report. Um, we've talked about the family hubs, we've um, 
heard about Best Start in Life, Strong Family, Strong Communities, and the SEND and Autism Strategies, and the work of the Children and Maternity Collaborative. So we very much want to make sure that the children's voices and the prevention agenda is embedded in all of that. And the fourth is a gypsy traveler education support officer. Again, uh, we've seen electively home educated um, rates of children in that community go up and to get them back into education is important. So that's the work of that officer. And the last, so those are the four funding that is from the public health reserves and that will be for two years. And the third proposal is for funding for the child weight management service, which would be an integrated service along with the national child measurement program, which measures children at reception in year six. I'm happy to take questions if that's. Thank you, Raj. Councillor King, please. Thank you, Raj, and welcome to CYP committee. Uh, we, I think all are really happy that we, you're here, we have the report and we have an opportunity to discuss those hugely um, important issues and pressing issues. One, uh, and I'm, I think there will be a, a number of questions here and we can we get to discuss all of, all of the points. One general thing that kind of strikes you is the, the magnitude of issues we're talking about here from eating disorders to all the other kind of issues and the bullet points and uh, the relatively modest numbers um, you have brought here for us to approve. So my specific question is about 2.2. So uh, families of children uh, and young people who self-harm. So I just wanted to ask as, as one of these parents and, uh, and you know, as a counselor here, what exactly this 102,000 over two years would deliver for, for us and how we can build on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So this is um, funding based on a pilot study that was delivered um, a few years back by a charity and um, uh, where they supported families of children, but um, who were self-harming and it is to expand that pilot it had a good evaluation so it is to expand that pilot project and we'll bring reports if that's what committee want in future so it is actually frontline service rather than a, an officer looking at what we should be doing about it that's okay right. that's excellent that's looking right. forward to seeing the, uh, the further right. reports thank you yeah, I'd be really interested in, in seeing the pilot scheme and, and how we can develop that going forward. Um, Councillor Daunton, please. Thank you for the report, Dr. Lakshman. Um, I'm interested in the funding for the eating disorder service. It come up at um, CPFT uh, quite regularly. Um, and it's a similar question really to Councillor King. It's 78,000 pounds of funding over two years. It's not a lot of money. Um, in fact, it's quite a small amount of money and it's only for two years. And yet we know that this is a huge problem. Um, so I suppose my question is, uh, why so little and why over such a short period? Um, and secondly, then, uh, will this allow the person to work closely with families? Um, I think to, to I think the family engagement is so important and actually so difficult, I think, at an early stage. Thank you, councillors. So I think the first point to say is that we are very acutely aware of the impact of eating disorders and the rise in eating disorders and the pressures it's putting on CPFT. This particular funding is a training offer for primary care uh, and other professionals and people working in schools and other areas about uh, firstly, early identification and recognizing the signs early on. And um, it's not a frontline service that we're funding. It is a training offer. And this complements some of the funding that's coming down from NHS England to, uh, in terms of training offers as well. So this is towards a local charity, which we have uh, uh, 
EDS, which is an eating disorder, which is a local eating disorders charity to deliver specific training across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. So it's in addition to what NHS England are providing in terms of training, which is a national through the charity BEAT, which is an eating disorders charity. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm particularly interested in the Gypsy Roma Traveller um, Education Support Officer, and thank you, Dr. Lakshman, for your report. Um, I'm really pleased that we are um, looking to support and provide an extra officer because I have one of the largest Gypsy Roma Traveller communities in my division. Uh, that's one of the largest in the country in my division. Um, and during the pandemic, I visited them quite frequently and I was very aware of how nervous they were of COVID and the risk of infection, um, but also the lack of understanding around testing initially and, and vaccination. But I mean, this gives you a, an insight. One of the first questions they asked when, when I was asking them if they would like to come and be tested, um, they said, will it, because we were providing testing in the community, and they said, will it just be us or will other people be coming in? And had we said other people will be coming in, they probably wouldn't have come for testing. So what I'm also very aware of is that this community um, works really well with our local schools, but the schools do need a lot of support. So um, thank you for your comment, for adding in the comment from, uh, the presumably the primary schools um, saying how much they would benefit from having an officer. So I absolutely completely support this uh, funding and thank you very much for giving us such a um, comprehensive report, but succinct report on it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bulat, please. Thank you, Chair. I actually had a question on the same uh, Gypsy and Traveller Education Support Officer, which follows nicely from Councillor Bradham's point about the importance of uh, having trust like in the community. And I was actually wondering how we'll work with, uh, to shape this role to work with uh, perhaps organizations uh, that are working with travelers, um, Gypsy Roma travelers nationally, or some of our local organizations who already work directly with uh, clients from our communities, whether it's organizations giving immigration advice or welfare advice or other types of advice. Because I think what's really key with this uh, support officer role is that there is someone who will be able to build that community trust and will be able to maybe even have those contacts prior. So I was wondering if any of the local organizations or even national organizations that work with this community would be able to even uh, help finding someone with this lived experience would help be in that role and uh, really uh, excel in that role connecting the communities. So I was wondering if you already had a plan to collaborate or at least advertise with some of those organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, for that suggestion. So we do have a gypsy traveler health team within public health. We have a team that works very closely with all lots of health issues among this community. So I will feed back your suggestion to them. I, I know that she's been at some national conferences and has got an award at the national level for some of the work that she's done, but I will definitely um, talk to her about your suggestion. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a whole, it's a small public health team that we have that works with them. Thank you. Councillor Hoy, please. Yeah, it was just a question really on the scrutiny of this, because obviously we aren't able to do any health scrutiny at this committee. So how are we going to find out whether it worked or didn't work or what the outcomes were? Uh, from my point of view, I'm sure Raj will come back to this committee, but it will also come under the uh, scrutiny that's done under Adults and Health. But if you'd like to comment, Raj. Yes, if you want to, to request a report back in a year's time, then happy to provide that for information. I know it can't be for scrutiny, but happy to provide any reports that you want. Thank you. I think that's everyone. So to move to the report recommendation, co-opting members of the committee are eligible to vote on this item and the committee is being asked to endorse this additional investment. Can I take this as being unanimously approved? I'm seeing nods. Marvellous, thank you very much, everyone.
Item 13. Item 13 is the Corporate Performance Report for quarter four of 2021-2022. Jonathan Lewis, Director for Education, and Nicola Curley, Director of Children's Services, are going to join us again to present this report. Thank you. Good afternoon. Again, again hello. Um, so this is our... Um, quarter four um, performance report um, and it's got some of the key in key indicators in it um, I think they're fairly standard and we know that you've read them so we're just happy to take any questions that you might have around them thank you thank you Councillor Hoy please Sorry, it was just on the EHCP one for Jonathan. Um, the send is obviously quite a few delays in assessments. And obviously you mentioned previously about um, the amount of places is going down. Do you, do you estimate that might rise when these assessments kind of get through the system? Uh, there, is a, there is a delay at the moment. Uh, we will see more EHCPs as a result of these initial assessments happening. Um, what our focus has been is, is processing all the ones in the system at the current time. So I think you'll see naturally an increase because we've been uh, dealing with the increased demand. Our EP service is solely now focused on dealing with this, this, this demand that's in the system. Um, but ultimately that, that will increase, uh, the, the percentage will go up, it is going up all the time. Uh, and I suspect we'll back somewhere towards national relatively soon. But if you look at national, it's actually decreased quite significantly. I think it's in this report, it's gone down quite significantly. So it's common pressure across everyone. Yeah, and also on the um, indicator nine about schools that are judged as good or outstanding in secondary, it seemed to, I, I, don't, I think you use the word cliff edge maybe is a bit too extreme, but it seemed to kind of dip quite um, significantly two times. And I wondered if there was any sort of particular reason for that, whether anything, it was just kind of a, sometimes with statistics, an odd thing happens that's then sort of makes it all out of whack. So I wondered if it was that, whether it was uh, more of a I think, Councillor Hoy, you picked a, an area I am very concerned about. We have seen a uh, decline in, in secondary schools uh, with Ofsted outcomes. Um, there is a certain cyclical nature of inspection where we've been through three five-year cycles. You know, we know Ofsted are about at least four terms behind at the moment, so we are seeing groupings of inspections coming through. But a uh, significant area of concern, I'm meeting with the, I'm going to the Secondary Heads Conference on Thursday. Uh, I intend referencing the challenges that we have. Uh, we did a lot of hard work to get these figures up back up because uh, they were one of the lowest in the country, but there is definitely an element of decline going on. So the challenge back to Academy Trust and head teachers, you know, needs to continue uh, to, to arrest these, this decline. Thank you. And I know it's something that our school improvement service and, and uh, local authority work really hard on, on uh, offering out to our Academy Trusts. Any further questions or comments? Sorry, Councillor Hay. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I noticed on the RAG rating, I'm well used to RAG ratings, red through to green and even blue, but contextual, that rather flummoxed me as to what, why things are marked contextual. And within here, one is actually marked suspended on page 17, uh, reading, writing and maths. Perhaps you could explain. Uh, yeah, I can certainly explain the uh, the key stage two writing. We we have uh, reading, writing, and maths. We haven't had any national assessments for the last three three years. Uh, ironically, you've picked the very day when it's restarted, so schools are getting those results for the first time. You won't see any reporting on this indicator for another whole year, though, because the government are using that for internal information. Next year, it will be a published statistic. So uh, we will share some of the data there. Uh, and if, if colleagues are interested, the national figure for uh, reading, writing and maths has gone down to 59% uh, from 65. So the impact of COVID nationally is quite significant, but that's the context around this one and why it's suspended. Um, in terms of the contextual one, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think that's, that's more an indication around uh, progress. I think it's, it's a measurement issue, but I'm happy to go away and, and look at the the, the, the situation behind that so I'm, I'm you know this if you could please because yeah. basically contextual meant nothing at all to me didn't give me any indication whether it's good bad or ugly yeah I think I think that's something relatively new I've not seen it before and apologies I hadn't picked that up before but there are there are a few so um 
in fact, looking at the RAG rating, uh, these are measures that track key activities being undertaken, uh, but where there's a target, it's not been deemed pertinent by the relevant service lead. So we don't have targets set for those particular areas. So we will address those. We'll come back and look at those because we should set targets for them. Thank you. If we can put that on the action log, please, Rashenda. Thank you. Um, I know the uh, website crashed this morning, so I'm hoping the schools have managed to uh, pick up their, their results already. Jonathan's nodding at me, so I'll take that as a yes. Any further comments or questions, please? Councillor King. Thank you, Nicola. I think that's for you. Uh, indicate 117, so we have... Um, 33.3% now of um, children subject to child protection plan with the target being 21. Uh, is it back to earlier discussion about um, things kind of coming through after the pandemic or uh, just maybe just a bit of a commentary on that? Thank you. So in terms of the child protection numbers, actually it's, it's a really pleasing Does work, doesn't it? And indeed, there's da da. Well done. Um, so sorry. Um, so so what I was saying um, is that actually we're we're seeing quite pleasing performance around child protection. Um, planning. So we had come down, so we're slightly victim of our own success. So we had, our numbers had declined quite significantly, and we were really pleased with that just as the pandemic started. So what we then saw during the, uh, the two years of the pandemic is that, that we then went back up quite significantly. So we're now coming back down. Um, we're not quite as low as we'd like to be at the minute, but actually the trend is very much in the right direction. So I'm quite pleased with that. And you would also want you wouldn't want to see a sudden change because you want to do these things in a planned and careful and risk managed way for, for children. So I think it, it's quite positive, but there is further work to do, absolutely. So if we look at the graph, I mean, we, we have January 22, um, just over 10% if I can draw the line kind of right, and, and now we're at 33. So that looks sharp increase, but what you're saying is what we're, What's not there is the current trend of it going down, right? Okay. Yes, the, the child protection plans are def def definitely coming down again. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Councillor Daunton, please. Um, thank you. I, I'd like to go back to your remarks earlier, John, please, about the um, secondary schools. Um, and just to, um, if you could... Uh, just indicate again your meet did you say that you're meeting with heads um to go through the, the figures and to look in more depth at what's going on there um the uh, it's the annual secondary head teachers conference on thursday uh, i've been asked to talk about challenges and issues that we're dealing with which will often cover things like SEND and other challenges uh, it's my intention to highlight the decline uh, and you know the conference is focusing on how we improve uh, educational outcomes. So uh, I think we need to bear in mind that every school, uh, secondary school is academy. There's no maintained schools in that sector. But obviously, we will do whatever we can to support and drive that change to support them to get, get to that situation. I think, again, remember, there is always a lag in the data. So there are some old inspections in there that we suspect will improve. But overall, we are concerned. Um, yeah, to go, I just want to follow up on the, the, the lag in the data. I was going to ask you about that. So that probably will explain some of it. Um, but I mean, this is a sort of overall figure. Have you any feeling for any shifts in that overall figure where you think there might be more problems and what your own feeling is before you go into that meeting? It's hard to be very specific about that. We have seen certain trusts do better than others. Uh, there are some trends around uh, that, that particular issue. Uh, and uh, I've spoken to several of the CEOs 
to, to offer my support, but also the challenge around, you know, outcomes should be better. Uh, and we expect uh, schools to address those concerns. Um, it is very ad hoc across the, the county, though, and you know our, our role is to continue to work with all stakeholders. You know they are still our children in our schools, so that that's the focus of our work in this sector. So, um, but you know where we are aware of it, we we do look at all our secondary schools on a termly basis, use feedback, and judge then whether we need to do more to support, challenge, uh, oversee what those schools are doing. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I see no further hands, so we are asked uh, to note and comment on performance information and take remedial action as necessary, and to note the forthcoming review of performance monitoring, which we have done. Thank you. So the final report is item 15, the Children and Young People's Committee Agenda Plan, Training Plan and Committee Appointments. Would the Democratic Services Officer please let us know of any changes to the published agenda plan? Uh, there's only one change, Chair, from the published agenda plan. That's a key decision report on the recommissioning and procurement of children's independent advocacy services in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, which has been added to the October meeting. Thank you. Do we have any comments on the agenda plan or can we take it as noted? I'm seeing nods. Uh, on the committee training plan, do we have any comments from the committee, please? And finally, we have committee appointments. We have one change to report, which the Democratic Services Officers Officer can take us through, please. Yep, that's Councillor Goodliffe replaced Councillor Bulat as the committee's appointee to the Virtual School Management Board on Friday the 17th of June. This change was made by the Executive Director for People and Communities under her standing delegation, following consultation with members at CYP Spokes on the same date. As previously requested, any changes to appointments made under officer delegation will be reported to the committee at its next meeting. Thank you. Do we have any comments on committee appointments or can we take that change as noted? In that case, the date of the next meeting, we have a reserve meeting date of Tuesday the 6th of September, which will be used in the case of urgent business. Otherwise, we will meet next on Tuesday the 11th of October and that will be back at the usual 2pm slot. Thank you, everybody. I now declare this meeting closed. <laughs>